Good morning, and a continued woohoo to those who just came in from dancing at Roxy's rooftop pub. <laughs> Forgive my croaky voice because I had to shout over the music. Uh, I'm Sandy Sorlene of the Transect Codes Council. Um, one quick announcement. Uh, this is a double session that runs partly into lunchtime, uh, but there should be half hour, 45 minutes or so in between. Um, for you to run across the eight laner and, and grab something before the two o'clock sessions. We do have a wide range of interrelated topics for you today and have recently added two more speakers who are, frankly, critical to this effort in the best sense of the word critical, Emily Talon and Matt Lambert. By this effort, I mean the support and evolution of a common language and set of tools coordinated by the framework of the rural to urban transect to implement zoning reform and permit many disciplines to understand each other in the complex task of integrated placemaking. This session came about for two reasons. One, thanks to the listserv conversations to which Dan Solomon alluded yesterday, we realized that many longtime new urbanists, including perhaps Dan, are not really aware of how the smart code works and thereby misunderstand how the transect has been locally calibrated, that means customized, and successfully applied. We are grateful to Doug Kalbaugh for encouraging us to offer a kind of remedial session for those who want to gain more clarity. By the way, we consider this session self-remedial too because if there are misconceptions, then the authors, editors, practitioners, and teachers of transect-based coding are at least partly responsible for them. We hope that this session can be a start toward teaching best practices more effectively, and we hope that your feedback will continue to strengthen such practices and education. The second reason is that we've observed over several years an occasional tendency for some practitioners to use the transect framework without the smart code and to apply transect zones to maps at the regional scale. Later I'll show, you, show why the regional scale is not where the T-zones live. If you look at the regulating plans of the new urban firms that use the smart code most, such as DPZ, Dover Coal, and placemakers, they consistently apply it at the neighborhood scale, at the fine grain of several zones per pedestrian shed. Andrews University has won several student charter awards with beautiful, fine grain regulating plans and customized smart codes. The problems seem to occur only, and you could correct me if you know of other instances, uh, but the problems seem to occur only when the transect is uncoupled from the smart code. And there are three or four instances that we can think of, but there may be other similar ones. Uh, for those who do not know the difference between the transect and the smart code, we will get to that. Andres has accused me of being obsessed with the scale issue. To that I say, damn right I am. And that is because it is connected to everything we as new urbanists are trying to do to create neighborhood structure, to support diversity of human habitats within neighborhoods, to attend to the human scale of frontages, thoroughfares, and civic spaces, to support transportation choice and access to mixed use, to coordinate across disciplines, to plug form-based codes like the smart code into existing ordinances, regional plans, or comprehensive plans, and to make it possible for municipal and regional jurisdictions to use our open source tools to guide their own development patterns economically. Yet we continue to seek effective solutions to regional problems, and that will be part of what we discuss and debate here today. We also have some history to impart and some interesting new proposals, diagrams, and ways of thinking. Let me introduce the panel. First we have Emily Talon, professor uh, in the School of Geographical Sciences and Urban Planning and the School of Sustainability at Arizona State University. She'll speak about the appearance of a rural to urban transect in historic codes, right? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> ne next. <laughs> oh, they're all sort of, yeah. Next will be Andres Duany of DPZ, also the CEO of the Center for Applied Transect Studies, or CATS, as we call it, with some background on how we got here from the Seaside Typological Code to TND Ordinances to the Model Unified Smart Code. 
sort of. After that, I will obsessively and briefly discuss the scale issue and introduce some possible solutions that other people have come up with. Then I believe Andres has some new images to show us, and then comes Matt Lambert, partner at DPC and Company, to present new ideas for community units and regional sectors, etc. And finally, Paul Crabtree of Crabtree Group will reveal some innovative ways to use the transect for stormwater regulations, also addressing the scale issue. Please welcome our panel. <laughs> and Emily. And Paul is an engineer. Crabtree Group is an engineering firm. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I think I might cause more um, problem for you, Sandy, with what <laughs> I'm going to talk about here. Um, basically, I was asked pretty recently to provide some historical context. So I'm just, I went through the book. Here's a plug for my book, City Rules, which is all about, there's a lot of history of code making in that book. And I pulled out what I thought were the most important things related to the transect idea. Um, so you're not going to find anything about smart codes in here, but um, I think that the very earliest codes, the very earliest zoning was transect based. So it sort of started out that way. And the zones that people were using were pretty large. So I don't know how that relates to where we are now. but. Um, I guess everybody knows that zoning comes from the Germans and in the 1870s, German engineers came up with the idea. Um, and so some of the original zoning codes that we have, we can look at, you see, I, I think of them as being very transect-like. They're basically more versus less intense zones, buildings and how they are to meet the street and the height they can have and even a few regulations about uses are all keyed into location within the city. The zones are large, there's, there's a lot of um, diversity within each type of zone. Uh, here's another example from Cologne and you see this is an actual translation of these three zones in Cologne. Um, simply, uh, you know, zone number one, the older part of the town where the buildings are highest and very close together. Uh, number, zone two, uh, lower buildings, greater space. Zone three, new town, lower buildings, certain spaces between each. This is an actual translation. Right, if you, I'll yes? Suggest that that, is, that could fit in a Twitter message. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Yeah, right. So simple, so direct. Everybody understood, apparently, initially anyway, what uh, this regulation was about. Now, intellectually guiding and working in with this is, of course, uh, Patrick Geddes, the um, Scottish uh, planner and regionalist who provided this incredible intellectual um, underpinning for zoning. He wasn't opposed to zoning, but he provided this way of thinking about where you live and what you do and the kinds of buildings you have is related to where you are within place. So he called it place, work, folk, people, occupation, place, all interrelated. And it's, it's very much the um, philosophy of a transect system. Um, and he, you might have seen this diagram of it, you know, the, where the shepherd is doing what the shepherd does relates to what kinds of environments that shepherd has, and it's all on a kind of continuum. <coughs> you had people like Raymond Unwin saying things like, let's not get bogged down with all kinds of technical things clogging our brain. We understand, um, you know, the planner has, so the point I'm trying to make here is the importance of nuance and how there was minimal, minimal regulations initially and people had the nuance to understand how to apply them. You even had people like Charles Mulford Robinson in, over in this country initially having this very transect-like language where he's talking about the importance of nuance. You don't want to have green everywhere. You can scale back that green when you're talking about dense urban places. 
Um, so I'm just going to show you a few examples of some of the earliest zoning codes we had. They also reflect that kind of simplicity, um, a very few zones here. This is Memphis in the 1920s. This is right after zoning um, is taking hold. And, um, you know, you have two different residence districts. You have a commercial district, an industrial. Yes. Can I yeah. Notice that they're the transit colors. They're not the red, orange, yellow of conventional zoning. Um, and then, of course, height and area, you basically just have, what, five, five different districts here. I love this one of Rochester. Three zones, A, B, C. Started out so simply, 1925. And even the New York Code, which, um, of course, is from 1916, Pretty, I mean, would you call it transect based? Pretty, um, very, you know, we're talking three different use well, districts. Form based for sure. Form based for sure. Yeah. Um, but it's simplicity, it's a range of intensities, I guess, in that sense, um, and being form based. And not, not complicated at all. Wait, what what yeah. all have in common is that they're not use based. Right. They do have use regulations, but they're very intensity. coarse. Intensity. Yeah, intensity level. Okay, so here's my thinking is where things start to fall apart is over in this country. So we started out with this kind of way of thinking of things. Then you get these kinds of comments starting to filter in the discussion. City planning is a science. You see how different that is from what Raymond Unwin was saying. You have Nolan, bless his heart, we love John Nolan, but here he is talking about how zoning is about highest and best use. These people, these planners, like John Nolan, knew the nuances, but they were fighting for legitimacy, they were fighting for their lives, they were fighting for the profession, so they had to say things like this. Um, and of course, there were the realities of the commercial city. In New York, you had stuff like this, you know, people just blocking each other's windows. You had this unplanned suburb kind of thing going on with our openness to commercial development and with lacking regulation and re lacking the tenacity and the understanding to hang on to those transect principles. Um, it just all kind of fell apart. Um, also from that um, 1929 study by the Regional Plan um, Association of America, you had the um, everything down to rules and regulations that started to lose the sense of what was going on initially in Germany. Um, here they are talking about efficiency. Um, it was all about order, the, the need for order. I love this um, graphic showing we don't want stores all over the neighborhood. We want them to be consolidated into you know, very certain locations, which made a lot of sense but it was based on the idea of order rather than, you know, the sort of um, having a range of intensities as initially proposed. Um, here is, and so what starts to happen, and you can just see it when you look at those original zoning codes and you pair them with what's happening now with the zoning, just a total unraveling of that pattern that made so much sense initially. Here's the same area in Phoenix in 1930 versus 2004. And you see it's just complete loss of understanding about transect principles. And I'll leave you with this, which is where we are now. This is Phoenix, 264 different zoning permutations, section of Chicago. Uh, I don't even know what that one is. So there you go. Thank you. Uh, Emily, that was really, I really learned a lot. Fantastic, really. Um, and you know me, I don't say that. Um, the, uh, Emily has a new book. Every year, Emily has a book. Uh, last year, it was called uh, Zo uh, City Rules. And it is, um, it is this and much more than this. And by the way, one of my favorite books is an earlier one. What's the name of it? The History of American Planning? New Urbanism, American. New Urbanism in American Planning that has, for me, one of the most fundamental, um, uh, I think, insights about new urbanism, how it is actually the conclusion of several threads of, of American planning, principle-based, 
process-based charter charrette, and it actually gives you a great deal of security that we're absolutely on the right track, so long as we stay balanced. And the new urbanism um, actually, like I think most uh, human endeavors, um, kind of follows what they perceive to be success excessively until it turns into failure. And I want, one of the things that should not happen is that we should just become uh, obsessively process-based and just continue to try to improve the process, improve the process, because actually what's going to cure the problem of process is being balanced with principle. So it's top-down, bottom-up, uh, principle and process, charter and charrette. And that's in her book. It gives the, the historical insight as to why she thinks that the new urbanism is, in fact, the, the synthesis and the conclusion. So those are important books. There are also other books, by the way, if you're a planner. Uh, there's a book in between those two, which is uh, design, urban design for planners. Um, anyway, um, I was asked to... Uh, um, by the ringmaster, uh, Sandy, to do two things. Uh, one of them is to give the history of the codes, and of course Emily really filled in because the history that I began was the history that I knew within our own office. And you always learn something. I don't know if you're going to learn as much as Emily showed, but, but this is perhaps interesting, how the smart code evolved. I already noticed that it's not in order. The lecture is not in order, so too bad because this is supposed to be chronological and historical. So I'll just kind of throw what happened. Uh, some many years ago, uh, a professor at the University of Miami was in control of the urban design uh, section of uh, architectural graphic standards, which is really the, it's the Vignola. It's the Palladio of the modern world. That's where you go look things up. And lo and behold, we were sitting there with 19 pages to fill. And many of the illustrations that came up uh, that you see the systematization of zonings and so forth were first done for architectural graphic standards. They're not transect based. But it's really a good read. You know, it is actually the shortest presentation of urbanism. And as always with our material, it includes both new urbanism and non-new urbanism. Okay? It includes the different ways to do uh, thoroughfares and also, for example, the cul-de-sac. It was not exclusive. But um, some several generations later, uh, the, there was a modernist coup d'etat, or perhaps a, an APA coup d'etat, and this was thrown out and, um, and restored with something that is not even antithetical to what we did. Uh, what characterizes it, it is that it is completely incoherent. They couldn't stand the coherence. Anyway, architectural graphic standards. Now, one aspect of the architectural graphic standards is that the last two pages actually included a code, like this. It was the TND ordinance, and it was, it, it was a matter of intensity. I do not know why we did this, except it was the most succinct way to put down a huge amount of information. And here's something about codes. G guidelines and textbooks explain Graphic standards doesn't explain. It just tells you what to do. You see? If you don't want to be told what to do, don't open this book. Go to another book. Go to another kind of book that tries to persuade you to do it. This is one that is, is authoritative. And so the, the, the succinct quality of this is due, entirely to, uh, is due entirely to the fact that it was architectural graphic standards. And this was the insight. I think fundamentally that we had, that a code actually says shall. And if it's, it's, if it's may and so forth, you don't have to put it down. Okay? So uh, this was the first, and this, this sheet was noticed by, oh, by the way, and then of course, since we're all maniacs in the new urbanism, the 19 pages became 72 pages, uh, which is the lexicon of the new urbanism. That is, you can download it, but it has never been published. But I have to say that I continually refer to this book to clarify things that I've forgotten and in my own mind. All the definitions that I think have made the new urbanism a movement um, come from this book. And virtually nothing is invented. You know, there is a difference between an avenue and a boulevard. There is a difference between, by the way, Dan didn't have it. Remember he was showing avenues and boulevards yesterday? He didn't get it right. Um, uh, there are streets and roads, there are alleys and lanes, there are passages and paths. Do you know where I got all this? 
the 1913 Funk and Wagnalls. Before the Second World War, the people who made the professions were still alive. John Nolan was alive. Uh, 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 Daniel Burnham was alive. The Germans were alive. Sita was alive. It was an amazing time. Because remember, the professions aren't that old. A lot of people were active, but the idea that you made a profession was late 19th century, and they were alive. Do you want to really know how to run a navy? You know what it all means? Well, Mahan was alive. F Jackie Fisher was alive. The people, you know, the great admirals wrote the definitions. And I found this book, and I said, oh my god, this is amazing. An avenue is different from a boulevard. And I looked it all up, and it was so beautiful, the system. It had such authority, and that's where we began. The reason we didn't print it is that I always suspected that the new urbanism was developing and that it needed to supplement and modernize. And I think now we're mature enough that we're going to be finishing this book. This is an early edition. This is a later edition. We're going to be tying it up and just publishing it. We've had a contract from McGraw-Hill for 10 years to publish it. And I think it's time now to just uh, uh, tie it up and go. Uh, now, the Seaside Code was a form-based code. And, uh, you know, normally, uh, this all sounds terribly immodest, okay? But we actually didn't know that form-based codes existed before. We really didn't. We were forced to do this for a very specific reason. And those of you who actually may not like places like West Palm Beach, you know, this 100 acres that were redeveloped, or Abacoa, it is almost exclu and by the way, they all follow principles of, th of thoroughfares. It's almost exclusively due to the fact that they were done by a single hand. <coughs> you know, when you see the main street, it doesn't matter how skillful it is. Frank Lloyd Wright would have done it, could have done it. Palladio could have done it. And three-quarters mile of main street, you'd hate it anyway. Okay, remember that one of the things about urbanism that makes urbanism urbanism isn't just mixed use and intensity and everything. It's diversity. So the whole protocol of new urbanism, the pro proper protocol, is how do you include as many people as possible making decisions sequentially? It isn't just the charrette where you bring people in. How do you establish a protocol that later, at the appropriate time, people can decide about buildings and people can decide about colors and people can decide about everything that needs to be decided? This insight was also pretty primitive. Our very first project it was in 1980, and we were very lucky, and it was built exactly like we wanted it, which I can't say that about any other project since. And it was quite urban in the sense that it had short setbacks and the housing had, you know, urban typologies. And it was about um, maybe eight city blocks, small blocks, but eight city blocks. And it was finished just as we designed it, and it was good. But I also noticed that when we, went sent pe we sent people to see it, they would show up, walk around the first block, and say, I really love it. Where can we have lunch? As opposed, and we said, so there's something wrong with this. I wanted to keep walking and say, look. And then there's the second block and the third block and the fourth block. And to me, they were all different because I'd made them different. But to them, it was by the same hand. And that's where I learned, finally and utterly and completely, that you cannot fake variety. It's still a project, and you can have the same architect putting a little roof on the right and a little roof on the left, and you know, purple and green, but you can't fake variety. And we learned that lesson very quickly, because it was urban, it was everything, but it wasn't urban, it was a project. It was still a project, just like downtown West Palm Beach. And Main Street is a project, it's by one hand. So when Seaside came along, and I, we had learned that lesson, we said, okay, well, here we have another chance, much bigger. Let's see how we can download to others. And we almost immediately came up with the idea of writing rules. And the code, this is the very first draft of the code from the charrette. And it's amazing how it held, how almost perfectly it held. So this was a form-based code. Now, the reason I say this is not because this is some kind of a serendipitous act of genius or something. It's the fact that if you really want to control the city, you will invent a form-based code. And if everything we do is forgotten, and Liz is convinced that it will be forgotten, by the way, whenever she thinks. <laughs> She says, this, this recession is so bad, it's going to be like the Depression. Everybody will die and be forgotten. <laughs> and they'll have to rebuild everything. You know, em the Emily Talons of the future are going to have to rediscover all the codes. 
they'll still reinvent, reinvent the form-based code. There's no way around it. And so, you know, there's no avoiding a form-based code if you want urbanism to emerge by the hands of others. Now, if you want to design the whole damn thing, fine, but you're going to have a, an, an architectural project. So this was the first code. And then we did it uh, later. This was still by hand. Note, amazing how old this was. And then we finally did one that was typeset. And I mean typeset, not computer set. We had to go, go to the typesetter and bring it and glue it and all this stuff. And it became more and more like this. And then over the years, it, uh, it adjusted as all codes must. But it held. The format held and held and held. And look at it. I mean, all the subsequent ones, they held. And this is the latest one. This is the one after Seaside almost being complete and people getting furious because there was redevelopment. You know, now they're beginning to demolish buildings and all the neighbors are scared about change and so forth. And this is one that hasn't, was just delivered to the, to the city council a few, uh, a few uh, uh, just a few days ago. And by the way, it includes much more definition. The old idea that you just tell people what to do, you can't do anymore because it's no longer the developer. It's no longer, it's no longer by contract. You have to explain what each of them means. So it's, a, it's kind of a hybrid. It's probably the worst of them all. By the way, probably they're all getting worse. I don't want you to think anything's getting better. That's an illusion. Okay, now, something happened also in Dade County, where we're from, from Miami, and a bunch of young people in the planning department found the TND ordinance. I don't think you were in the office yet. It was a little later. Found the TND ordinance and said, let's then make this an ordinance for Dade County. And so that's the first time we actually hit lawyers. And what happens with lawyers, it's both very good and very bad, they make things very, very precise. They assault every meaning. What do you mean by that? It must only mean one thing and so forth. Now, I happen to love that rigor. Uh, but they also, the really useful thing was not only that rigor. No, notice, remember the size of the one from architectural graphic standards to this? It's probably four times it's bulked up to four. But this is, this is the embedding documentation. There's always a larger system national law, state law, and so forth. And you have to plug it in. And this is the embedding. This, these are the several protocols. Some of these protocols connect to the, to the system, and some of these protocols are instructional. And then this is actually what you do, and these are definitions. And there's some controversy as to whether definitions can be administrative or not. You know, whether you can put administrative stuff in definitions. I don't think they should be. But anyway, this is what happened to the code. This was actually passed in Dade County. This code was passed, completely passed. You could have built a TND in Dade County in the, in the middle 80s, which is astounding. Did anybody ever build a TND in Dade County? Guess what? No, they didn't. They tried, but you know what happened? Remember, a code allows you to build as of right, okay? You can build junk as of right. This code, because of the fear of the elected officials, you couldn't just follow this code as of right. You had to consult with the neighbors. So you can imagine what happens when you go to the neighbors and we say, well, really, what we're going to do here is smaller streets that are open, no cul-de-sacs, mixed use. I know you love that. Uh, affordable housing, yes. I know you've been waiting for this. And density. Okay, it's like the, you know, four Harakiri swords handed to, the, handed to the developer. Here, kill yourself four times. These codes, TND ordinances, okay, the public process does not arrive at a conclusion that people want poor people in their proximity or shops in their proximity or transit in their proximity, okay, or density in their proximity or even parking on the street. If you think that, that the public process actually, it, it actually is the opposite. If you really want to change the world, you have one big war in which everybody has a say, and once it's code, it has to be as of right. Because very few developers will take you up on it on the complexities of doing a, a, a community, like a new urbanist community, and plus you have to convince the neighbors. The whole idea of having a code is that it's as of right. And probably the single greatest problem isn't just the transect, you know, the fractal problem that Sandy's going to deal with. It's the fact that too many TND or, or uh, smart codes actually are still subject to the scrutiny of the public process when the suburban crap is not. 
you know, and you have to be a nutcase to actually do a TND ordinance that has to go through the public process. Now, the ordinance itself, you understand, has to go through the public process. But once it's in, the developers have to be able to act as of right. So here's a beautiful, very early ordinance, way before the foundation of the new urbanism, that actually was never used. Actually, it was used a couple of times, and it crashed like the Titanic, even faster. Other codes for much larger places than Seaside, for example, Kentlands, uh, uh, have been in place, and actually th they survived the demise of the developer. One of the things you should know is that many, many projects lose the original, the original developers, and if they're coded properly, it doesn't happen. You'll see a rather, a very, very mediocre project called Abacoa nearby, if you've seen it, and I'm being kind. Uh, and that was designed by Calthorpe, Polyzoides, and DPZ. So you can imagine, it was the all-star cast. It was done by the MacArthur Foundation. It was going to be a great ecological uh, thing. The developer lost it for just because the bankers wouldn't play ball uh, six years into it, and it was not coded. And if it's not coded, it isn't going to happen. Okay, so you, if you really care about your work, do not assume you're going to be in charge. Don't, do not assume the humans that are there at the beginning are going to be there at the end. If you want it to come out right, you have to code. I actually kind of refuse to do projects that don't get coded because developers say, trust me, I'll do the right thing. Or the municipal authority says, we have the best planner in the world. You know what happens to a TND planner, to a planner that does a TND? They get hired by a bigger city within months. Okay, when we did the plan for X, six months later, that person was running Houston. So do not assume even that the municipal planner remains in place. You have to code. Now, we also added something that CSAT doesn't have, which is an architectural code. The, 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 the TND ordinance is a smart code. And when, this distinction used to be one of the most complex things we spoke about. There's urban regulations and architectural regulations. The architectural regulations are syntax. They're style regulations. This is different from a pattern book. You will see that the TND, the DPZ TNDs do not illustrate. Okay, they say beam shall be two by six. And I actually object to pattern books, to what UDA does. Now, I will always recommend UDA, like if a developer comes to us and says, I want a pattern book, we will send them to UDA to do a pattern book. But my belief is that if you have a pattern book, you don't even need an architect. You just get a draft when you put it together. So if there's going to be a project that is not going to have an architect, by all means, you need a pattern book. But if you're going to hire an architect, somebody that's creative, that's going to think things through, then you need to give them much less, and it shouldn't be illustrated, to allow the architect to be inventive. And if you look at the DPZ communities, if you look at Windsor, if you look at uh, Seaside, if you look at uh, Alice Beach and Rosemary Beach, they really are different from the communities by other firms. And that's because we're very careful about downloading architecture to others and downloading architecture to many others, not just three or four others, and they get that authenticity that happens when architects within reasonable terms can actually act. If you look at Celebration, for example, okay, Celebration has much less vulgarity than Seaside, right? But it all has, it has nothing you can remember because it's neither bad nor is it good because it's really in the rigid middle range. If you look at Seaside, you'll see things much worse than Celebration, but also much better than Celebration. You know, the oscilloscope is much, is much higher. And this is due to architectural regulations that are not pattern books. So that's a clear choice for developers. Pattern books, right down the middle, nothing too exciting, nothing too bad, or you can do these kinds of codes and you'll get some real action. Now, very early on, by the, way, you can, by the way, you can code anything you want. If you find, this is something I was allowed to say yesterday, if you can't code, it's not a problem with the format and it's not a problem with the English language. It's a problem that you haven't decided what you want. And stop tinkering with the language, stop tinkering with the format, and go right back to the design and figure out what you actually want, because the minute you're clear about what you want, you can code it. Okay. For example, this is very early on, Nance Canyon, we coded a solar-based, this was uh, middle 80s, we, we coded a solar-based, uh, there was a, this complete TND that's solar-based, and all the streets are asymmetrical. You know, it was an east-west street, it's not the same as, as a, a north-south street, and so forth. It was very interesting. And we could just code this because we had decided to do it. 
By the way, this has not been picked up. In, uh, this is one of the early things. And then something, uh, I was speaking to a landscape architect yesterday, uh, speaking about how weak our, um, our uh, landscape proposals were. And I think we have actually let go of that. I think we have really let it go, and it's been captured by the landscape urbanists. You know, the, the fact that we're so matter of fact, you know, trees, you know, the, the squirrels all look the same way. Early on, we were extraordinarily, extraordinarily careful about this. For example, this is a typical early code, Haymont, very early. Uh, planting on public tracks, okay? Planting on the public and then pri planting on private lots. One of the things that John Nolan used to do, which is so beautiful, when you and, and Olmsted, when you visit the communities, is that the public planting was coordinated with the private planting in the front. And so when you go, for example, the clearest example is Myers Park. <coughs> when you go to Myers Park, it looks like the houses have been inserted in a woodland. So beautiful, so coherent. You say how skillful how they put the roads between the woods. How skillful how the houses were inserted. No, the thing was a potato field. If you look in 1927, the thing was a potato. It was cleared. It was ugly as, as could be. But because the private and public planting were coordinated, it grew into a single coherent piece. And that's very much Olmsted's idea of a shared public realm in nature. It wasn't like, you know, <coughs> sorry, but I went to Home Depot this week and this is what they were selling. So that's what I put in my front yard. And you know, my mother loves daffodils, that's what I put in the front yard. That's backyard stuff. The front yard is, is the public realm, it's coordinated. We used to be extraordinary at this, okay? Planting in public tracks, private tracks, and then here it says, um, just to read it out, large squares and parks, small residential squares, avenues, boulevards, large streets, small streets, and then the other side, deciduous cab canopy, uh, medium, God knows, deciduous trees, small flowering trees, you know, shrubs, etc. Very systematic. And by the way, I do remember this code. This was done by the fellow who was. Uh, we, our consultant was the dean at, uh, at Virginia, became the dean at Virginia. I, forget it, I don't know what his name's on it. But it was very interesting because he actually drew the trees. And this is the first time that we actually began coding by shape. And if you look at the smart code now, it's by shape. Because there are many, many species that can survive here or there. It's not that precise. But some, some trees are going to bonk onto the building. They're going to bonk the building. Some trees are going to sort of, uh, you know, droop on the on the trucks going by and so forth. And, you know, it's not just about root pressure, you know, and survivability and climate and being ecological. It is about, in fact, this. We had this so advanced. This was so advanced. It was incredible. Okay. The seaside plan was exceedingly simple. It was just lots, right? And you looked at the regulating plan, and it said type 2, and you looked at your lot, and that's what you did. And then the Prince of Wales asked us, uh, uh, Leon Creer had, um, had asked us to uh, code, uh, I'm sorry, the Prince of, Leon Creer had designed Poundbury. And we, the Prince of Wales, who's an amazing, absolutely amazing fellow, I would say kind of genius, had actually found one of our codes. And instead of saying, aha, one more piece of paper among thousands, he said, this is it. He literally said, this is it. And then uh, we received a letter that said, if Elizabeth and yourself are ever coming to England, I'd love you to drop by the palace. Uh, and how about February 19th? <laughs> right? So we got the ticket, bought the suit, thank God. You know, don't ever try to go as an American. And... Uh, bought the suit and we showed up and we, you know, he's a very young Prince of Wales. And what most impressed me was that his, uh, his entire house was full of books as high as his knees. It wasn't just bookshelves, okay. He, there were pathways between stacks of books. The guy's an absolute intellectual. You know, he's really amazing. And he again repeated, he said, I saw the code and I thought that was it. And he called the Minister of the Environment right there. <laughs> Same thing, do you suppose Mr. Lutyens, his name was Lutyens, as I remember, do you suppose Mr. Lutyens is available? You know, Lutyens gets on the phone 
and he said, you must meet these people. He wasn't available for a meeting, Liz and I. And I think that this might have been pivotal if we had actually spoken to the Minister of the Environment at that time in England, which was really early. But we didn't, and it was lost opportunity. Now, Leo Creer didn't want to be coded. He did not want to be coded. And one of the things he did, he actually kept throwing the impossible at me. The impossible. Now, you may notice that there are a couple things about Pembury that are really weird. Like, for example, there's a house here. Where is it? There's a house somewhere that has a frontage in the back. Okay? In other words, the front of the house is in the back. Why was that? To stump the code. <laughs> You see, you know, I spent a week with him, and it was just amazing. It was like playing chess by somebody who didn't want to be coded and wanted to be able to tell the Prince of Wales that the whole endeavor had, had changed. And me sort of, as soon as he decided something, I found that I could code it. I could generate the material. So here you get the first regulating plan. Okay, the special, uh, what's it called, Sandy? The special, uh, special conditions. The what? Special requirements. Notice that it's still one, two, three, right? Just like the code. But all the tools were minted here. This is the frontage. You see the hard line in front? This says that what really we're coding here, what matters is that, not the back. Okay? This is saying that in this building, it all matters, all four sides. This is saying that approximately here, there will be a courtyard. This is saying that here and here and here will be arcades. This is saying that there's a terminated, let's see, how does it go? This little square means there's, there's a cupola here. There's a terminated vista. There's an element like that. And so this new tool gets minted, which is not only the passive regulating plan, but the active regulating plan that has a whole series of additional tools that can be more precise. And that grew out of the challenge of career, the most amazing, exhausting week of my life. And by the way, I won that chess game. And that's how we became friends, because you can know, you know, that when we first met, it was like, oh, you know, he didn't like it at all. But basically, it was really interesting to do that. And the Poundbury has this code. Now, Poundbury, unusually, has had the same person administering from beginning to end. Very, very unusual. Same guy, I forget his name now. So this is not used the way it would to transfer knowledge to the subsequent town architects. It's the same town architect. Because it's in his head, he just tells the architects what to do. So they, they've stopped pulling out the, the big document, and they just say, you know, I forget his name. Everybody knows his name, though. And he, he just tells people what to do. But you see, it's very long. Do you see how rich the typologies become? You know, it's two, pl two sets now. And by the way, the architectural code of Poundbury was also both a great success and a great failure. Creer coded everything in the local vernacular. I remember him going through and saying, we know the first, the, the, in here somewhere it says the, 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 he didn't want to use, there's something, before paint, before there was waterproofing, there was pitch, literally asphalt, the shiny asphalt. And he wanted, he wanted the wood finished in pitch, you know, the gates, and he wanted the bottom four uh, courses of brick to be in pitch. And, that's in there, you know, the pitch. And he got so excited about this tool that he actually made it into a complete collection of all the vernaculars in essentially, I would say, the big quadrant northwest of London. He basically made it a collection of everything that was possible. If you look at Poundbury, it suffers from an excessive amount of vernacular choice. Okay? It's a catalog of the buildings of England. And it may be very interesting, but it is very incoherent, and at some level, it's kind of Disney-worldy, because it has too many, too many. That's not the way it happens. You're imposing a kind of Disney-world encyclopedic attitude. Okay, not good. If you look at the DPZ towns, the Windsors, the Alice Beaches, particularly the Alice Beaches, etc., we constrain the vernacular, right? The activity, the variety, does not come from many, many vernaculars. It comes from a single vernacular and many architects. And I can't repeat that enough. A single vernacular and many architects. It's not a single architect and many vernaculars. That's Disney World. In fact, if you look at Celebration, 
and I should speak about the pattern books of celebration, which are unbelievable documents. This is how, how it happened. Disney was terrified of kitsch, because of course they are kitsch central. So when they did celebration, they said the one thing we don't want is to be kitsch. And so they went through this very automatic protocol that was actually managed originally by Bob Stern and then by Ray Gindros, in which they identified all the vernaculars of the United States, a huge endeavor, then all the vernaculars of Florida. At that point, there were 21 vernaculars. And then they identified the ones that were still buildable, and they were left with something like 12. Some are just not buildable. And those 12 are coded in celebration. And so you get a Mediterranean revival house, you get a craftsman house, you get a coastal house, you get a, a Greek revival house. Okay. And in, in my opinion, celebration is very fakey and Disney worldly after all, because that's not organic. They looked at the vernacular styles and coded them. It's not organic. The thing to do is to select one appropriate style for Central Florida, modify it to modernize it if necessary, and then let many architects loose at it. So this is a very important distinction about how to, how to do architectural codes. And Poundberry is really suffers from this code. This code had all the vernaculars. Windsor is a very good project. If you visit it, there's going to be a trip on, on Sunday. It has a single vernacular. And here you see Windsor actually with a very sophisticated regulating plan uh, done by Jeff Farrell when he was in our office and basically choosing corners like the house should actually <laughs> You know, this is a, the first code that actually started worrying about the privacy of the backyard. Seaside has no privacy in the backyards. If there's an evolution in the new urbanist communities, is, is an increase in the consciousness that you also code the backyard for privacy. And then the smart code. The smart code was when we took all this stuff and embedded it in a protocol that connected to the existing to the existing uh, system to administer it, the 27,000 planning departments. We also became very interested after doing a few of these crafted communities, you know. Okay, so we did pretty beautiful seaside. It's not that beautiful. But we did much more beautiful Rosemary Beach and then much more beautiful Alice. And we said, well, what's next? Like, you know, what's up? What are we going to do for the rest of our life? And we realized that it wasn't about just doing one more really good DPZ community. It was about actually taking these protocols and making them you know, it was the problem of large numbers of modernity. How can this really affect? We also realized that many municipalities that wanted us to code for them couldn't afford us. So we had to prefabricate the codes, and then we got very interested in this becoming a model code, freeware in the Internet. And that's when everybody joined in. And uh, there are about to be ten versions. I think Max, uh, Matt is going to show you the latest. But the richness of this, this code is now the work of 30 and 40 people. You know, if you code and you learn something, like placemakers are doing tons of codes, and they make available their insights. But you also have people who are all the specialties, all the specialists, you know, the, the people who know about dark sky, the people who know about, about uh, uh, um, uh, drainage, the people who know about streets, the people who know about this. And um, uh, uh, for the last few years, Sandy has been managing some 30, what, how many modules? 35 modules, so you get the base smart code. Okay, let me give you also a distinction. The smart code had an earlier version that was richer, that had, let's say, architecture and lighting and stuff. And then people come up to me, would come up to me and say, well, we, we implemented the smart code, but we had to take out the signage ordinance, or we had to take out the lighting ordinance, or we couldn't get public works, we had to take out the sidewalk ordinance. And then I thought, well, that's too bad that they're feeling bad. Why don't we just take them all out, put them in separate modules, and then they can add them in and feel good? <laughs> you see, that was a real psychology. So they could administer the straight smart code, and they could choose this wonderful. By the way, if you ever want to teach urbanism, everything about urbanism, and you don't want to buy a whole textbook on exterior lighting or urban landscaping or public space or septet, just get the modules, because the modules are the pressy of the sum of knowledge, usually written by the national expert. They're actually the cliff notes. Now, they don't explain, because it's a code, but it's all there. If you ever want to teach urbanism, the 40 modules are all there. It's really an extraordinary they 30. Have annotations too, so they oh, so they even have annotations. That's right. 
they have the code and the manual. And it all plugs into this, to this absolutely incredibly elegant system that uh, somehow it bugs some people, you know. And by the way, we don't prevent anybody else from making their own codes, calibrating their own codes, or coming up with a different system than the transect. You know, I'm always telling people, write your own code. But right now, I'll tell you very clearly, there is no plan B. There's no plan B. There's you either do commercial, you know, uh, excuse me, conventional suburban development codes, or the smart code. This idea that you can do something else, you end up with a very weak smart code or a slightly better suburban, suburban code. There is no plan B. Okay, and I think, and if you think you have a you have a problem, that is, oh, this is DPZ. We don't, can't do it. It's not DPZ. I mean, how many times do we have to show you that it's been, a, you know, that the transect has been around for 200 years? How many times have we got to show you that it builds on others? How many people? How many co-authors do you have to have for a code, before people can get off the fact that it's not DPZ? I mean, what's up with that? Because the principal resistance is the fact that somehow it's a DPZ brand thing. And it ain't. It's at least 35 or 40 people. Now, the fact that it's elite, okay, get over that. It's superb, okay? If you want a piece of junk, I can give you a list of consultants, okay? <laughs> so if you have a problem with elite, but even today I'm challenged by, by Emily's, I want to write a Twitter code. And the smart code, just to get this over with comprehensively, includes a form base. You know, there are a lot of people that do form-based codes that are saying, well, they're form-based codes and smart codes. It's not true. The smart code is, has a form-based component. It is a form-based code at every level, but it happens to have all the plugins into the reality, okay? It, it's a form-based code that plugs into it and incidentally also has a regional component. You know, so it actually, it, it's not only, not only does it, does it have a, a, a width of what it deals with, it has a range in scale. It goes from the region to the architecture. It is a complete, it is the first unified comprehensive code. And by the way, it's, you can, it also has this beautiful administrative checklist. So this is one instance. This is what you hand to the owner of the lot. But you can also check it. Everybody can check it. Virtually every good idea gets incorporated on it. And what I've asked Matt to do is to collect a hodgepodge of good ideas that have not yet been decanted to show you just how this continues to be the tool forge of urbanism. Um, there is, uh, it, oh, this is yours already, isn't it? This is mine. Okay, well this is, uh, uh, there, there are books, uh, guidelines, this is, uh, this is what happens. Galina Takieva, a uh, partner in our office, wrote a book uh, called The Sprawl Repair Manual. Ellen Dunham Jones, the, profe the chairman at Georgia Tech, wrote The Sprawl Repair Manual and they're getting together and writing a pressy. Okay, this is a, a, com a comment that's coming out that is a succinct version of a much bigger thing. I just spoke to one of the heads of the ITE a minute ago, that's why I was late, and he was saying, we must write the book. And I said, the book has already been writing, written. It's the context-based manual for, major th for thoroughfares. The ITE wrote it, and it's based on, this, on the transect. The problem is that it's a fat book, that's the problem. And, you know, you can take it everywhere you go. Very few people want to study. So what I told this guy is instead of writing another book, just take the, that substance and make it thinner. Just take the junk out, you know. Take the confusion out, take the junk out, improve the graphics, and make a six-page version that people will actually read. And this is what's happening here. This is a committee that got together. By the way, if you ever have an idea in a CNU to do something with new urbanism, you don't have to ask permission. You don't even have to not say it's not CNU. Do it, okay? This is a, both an elite and an open organization. Nobody asks for permission to do anything. And that's what they're doing. And this is somebody else, right? Okay. And do you have any questions on that? Or do you want to wait? Uh, maybe, maybe wait, just to make, because we have so many people. Okay. To make sure we get, get stuff in. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I'm... Um, where's that slide? Huh. Oh, my first slide's not there. There's one here. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the um, scale issue, and it's connected to a number of um, initiatives and systems and practices, uh, and I'll try and tie them together as best I can. Um, this is what I was referring to in the introduction, that we occasionally are seeing the application of the transect at a really large scale. And this is um, not a problem if the standards associated with that scale, I mean, they're just de map designations, if the standards and policies associated with them are appropriate for that scale, no problem. The problem arises when if someone wanted to use the smart code at that scale, it would be an utter disaster. Um, if if uh, the transect is being shown as the model transect that looks like the one in the smart code and is being used at the regional scale, it's potentially undermining a common language and a common understanding of what the T-zones are. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we have that diagram up. But um, just so you know the scale here, this is uh, all of Baltimore County. And on the right is part of a regulating plan that I'll show you the, the full plan so you can see how nice it is uh, by placemakers of Florence Gardens in Gulfport, Mississippi. <laughs> And the circle is, of course, the standard pedestrian shed, a quarter mile radius. And you can see the key here. Uh, there are five transect zones within that one pedestrian shed. That's the fine grain at which smart coders are applying the transect zones. And they have the same, basically the same transect there, transect zone numbers and names. And uh, the scale here is this cutout is nine miles across. And each of these little like inter uh, root signs would be about three ped sheds. So this is all, you know, one zone, this beige color. Um, so it's not that um, the particular codes or comp, comp plans or vision plans, vision documents that people are producing are bad. In fact, you know, they may be very good and they may work really well for that jurisdiction. It, it, I'm just talking about a common language issue. And uh, especially when something is um, freeware, perpetuating misunderstandings. So um, initially the, the regional scale in Baltimore County was done by Elliot Allen who uses, uses a sector system that is, is this similar to the one in the smart code. And at some point it shifted over and just got renamed transect zones. So they had, you know, uh, the right idea with regard to the smart code if that's what they wanted to do. Uh, and at, at some point during the process it just got shifted. This is also a very large scale application of, of T-zones and it is um, the Nashville Community Character Manual which uh, is already showing very good results. Um, an outstanding new urbanist, Rick Bernhardt, is the planning director there. And I've talked with him a bit about this so I could really understand, you know, how they use it. And um, again, you know, a, a quite a large scale for the transect zones. And that's not actually the scale at which they're regulating development. They do have this very fine grained scale that are, are, are these, um, they call community character policy zones, and they're all these, and you, you'll see that they're like subzones of the transect. Now, smart coders will subzone transect zones, but it's within that very, very fine grain already. Um, so these these distances, you know, here's a scale of one mile. So these distances, you know, are much more fine grain, and um, they're getting good results. And other cities are studying what they're doing. The problem is, is really only this, and, and all I would ask of this sort of occurrence is that they just don't call them T-zones. And it's this, where the T-zone that should be coded at a very fine grain is the huge category, then it's broken down into 
this is this is this is incorrect. This is the Nashville. This is a page from the Nashville Community Character Manual. So they do this for each of the each of the so-called T zones using you know a, a DPZ transect illustration, which is fine to use. You know this is all open source material on the CATS website, but then you have neighborhoods within T3. You have centers that in, in the manual look like, look like T5. They look like little main streets in T3. And every zone has that kind of a breakdown. That's a fine way to organize, but it's not what the transect zones are intended to do. You're too nice. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> If they just change the name, it would, you know, and don't show that transect. But um, this is, this is a, an understanding of the transect as being regional that has some basis in the early essays um, and the early uh, literature that, of the new urbanism that spoke of it that way. So I can see where it comes from. Um, so here are just a few quotes I pulled out of the transect reader that will be coming out um, from Katz. And I was uh, reading over essays, you know, looking for uh, where some, some of these ideas that it's regional came from. And we've talked in the past on listservs and so on about how, it's, how the transect is fractal. And we will still say that. You could have a transect, which is, after all, just a path or a slice through the environment. And a transect can be any size. Um, that's a transect, small t. And... Um, uh, we talked about being fractal. It's such that you know you could have a regional, a regional transect, a neighborhood scale transect, and a transect of the front of the house to the back of the house. The front of the house building might be more urban, and the back more rural. That's a common condition, and Andres has spoken of that before. So some of these, um, some of these comments in essays, even if the rest of the essay is getting it right. Uh, they fix, I think they fixed. These were written in you know, 2000, 2001, 2002. And they may have just fixed in the new urbanist um, way of thinking of it. And uh, it's quite understandable. So um, then Andres and Emily wrote a piece in 2002 that explains really what, you know, what they're thinking. Um, <laughs> I think you guys can all read that, so I won't read the whole thing, but just the, the colored parts um, that the principles work simultaneously at different scales, but in different ways. That's really important. And you have a nested series of coherent levels. That's how the smart code is organized. And I'll show you the outline that shows this nesting relationship. And Bruce Donnelly talks about that a lot, too, the nesting relationship. It's a great way to think about it. Um, Scale must be taken into account. And, um, you know, it's interesting that uh, when you look at the broad scale, say, you know, if you look at a region um, as big as Baltimore County, you will see differences that at this broad scale, you know, they're there. So you want to think of a place as urban or suburban or rural in this larger way. Um, it's possible to do that. But to actually code urban design, that's, too, that's just too large a scale. So um, one scale at a time, um, they're saying acknowledge the interconnections across scales and not apply only to one scale at a time. Now, that seems to be going back a little bit to you know, a little mushing it together. But um, it's, they're very clear in that first paragraph uh, what, 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 they're re what they really mean. Um, and then this one, regions and neighborhoods can be designed similarly, similarly to each other. They, both the region and the neighborhood scales require a center, a circulation system, and a civic realm. So there's that fractal quality. Now what is the problem? Um, touched on it already, but just for visually, the diagram on the left, or the illustration on the left is by Tom Lowe. And um, I'm sure most of you have seen it. The, um, uh, upper part is cities and towns made of neighborhoods, and then the bottom is, is undifferentiated sprawl. Um, I took this diagram and altered it a little bit because the condition really 
is more like there, there are still traditional town patterns within sprawl. So I pulled some of them down to the bottom like that. And so the problem is if you're going to apply a, a, a one T-zone across all these conditions or one zone of any kind, it doesn't have to be a T-zone, um, one set of regulations across all these conditions, you're not distinguishing between all these uh, different issues on the right side. Um, so that T3 question mark is, you know, is that whole, is that whole town there T3? And that sprawl in between T3? And, and so forth. So, and uh, up, up top is, is T2, does T2 contain villages or do villages contain T2? And T2 and T1 are interesting and um, I'll show a, an adjusted diagram to, to um, help us understand them, but th they can go off at, the, at a larger scale. That's their, that's their nature. Uh, but, but they're not really developed, so um, you know, you don't, you're not going to run into the kind of uh, sprawl producing that would happen if you tried to spread out all the standards over, over a great geographic area. So, oops, where did water go? And um, the top one is the current model transect diagram and the six T zones that were system, systemized uh, by DPZ for zoning and the special district that's outside the normative system. So, um, and there will be different diagrams proposed. And people see that this diagram is everywhere and people are sometimes reading it that as, as, as a regional. You know, because it's abstract, you, you can think of it at a different scale. If you look closely and take it literally, it's not, but it's, it's abstract enough that you don't. The bottom one is uh, from 2000 that DPZ did for Sarasota. And that's, that, that's a, the top one's a model transect. And that gets calibrated, customized, analyzed carefully in every place that we work. And the, and the bottom one is, is the kind of transect that you might end up with um, for a specific place. So you know it has two downtown zones. One is downtown Bayfront. Um, so when um, they got to the regulating plan stage, the zone names changed back to the model zone names, but you'll see the way the transect is applied there is it's not a fried egg where, you know, the densest zones are in the middle. Because it has a waterfront, the density is on the edge there. Sure. But an urban neighborhood is the reverse. And you see it here in Sarasota. This is a neighborhood. It has a name. It operates as a neighborhood. But the edge has the higher density because that's where the streets are. Do you see that? And so we have to get rid of the edge of that terminology because people were saying, you know, people were saying neighborhood center, the neighborhood center zoning was actually at the edge. So that's when we, we got rid of the neighborhood. And what we lost was the median fractal clarity that, that right, Pat M, uh, Sandy, that showed immediately there wasn't the neighborhood. But, but the edge center didn't work. Perhaps that was a mistake. But, but we certainly were having a very difficult yeah. time calling this neighborhood center right. when it was at the edge. It, it, it depends on, on, on whether you're in the city. Yeah. And when you're in the city and you have these types of neighborhoods that are next to each other, then yes, it goes to the outside. When you're, when you're in the country outside of the city where, where places aren't next to each other, when they have the center type. Right. We, that's, that's so they both there. exist. Yeah. Will you talk about that, Matt, a little bit when you're showing yours? or? Briefly. Okay. This is a good one to, to discuss it. Yeah. Anyway, these are the main oh. streets. Oh. The, this, these are high rises. These are all about views, high rises. But the actual commercial main streets are here. That's, you know, that's what. Right. 
Okay. Um, so now the question is, is that model transect? These things are all, you know, open <coughs> source. Um, people can certainly use that transect framework without the smart code. Uh, but, you know, is, the, is that model transect of those six zones supposed to be what is in the smart code? Where in table one there are descriptions of the character of each of those zones and it is very clear that they're at the neighborhood scale. Um, so, you know, this is something debatable. Um, well, Andres might say it's not debatable, but the, uh, the, the only three model codes are, are the smart code and two variations of it that are available, you know, for, for the public to use. Uh, different firms, you know, have their own models that they use for, the, for their jobs. But the one in the middle is called a transect code. What's it called? A transect base code. And that was Chad Emerson making the language a little more um, everyday, less technical sounding language in it. And it's just the text. It doesn't have any tables. And then the third one is the neighborhood conservation code is a code for infill where the, the, the regional component is not in it. And it's sort of that, that module um, mentality. It's like, well, if you want the regional component, we have Article 2.2. You can put it back in. But, um, this, this is simpler. It's also organized in a different way that I hoped would um, make the scale issues clearer, and that is to say the tables that go with each scale or um, there's, a public se there's a public section for civic spaces and thoroughfares, and the tables that go with that are with that, so you know who administers that, and, um, and then uh, you know, for each, each scale, the community scale, and then the actual zoning, the tables are separated to go with those, with those uh, so chapters. There, 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 because we, this is not a seminar on the code itself. This is either a confusion vaccine, vaccine <laughs> against confusion, and those are the cool, the cool and stuff. What Sandy did here, the tables in this code are all at the end. So if you pull out a section and say, I don't need regional, you need to pull it out of two sections here and the tables at the end, and you lose the, you lose the numbers. And you, but she didn't yeah. take the tables and put them right behind each section. So when you pulled out a section, the tables went with it. And so and then she yeah. went ahead and did it for infill. So that's really a module that's complete. It consists of, of just the three sections that, are, that work for infill. But you could have yeah. always done this before. Yeah, you could have. Yeah, yeah it, but it does help. I think clarify the, the scales um, and uh, is less intimidating and then some you know small towns will look at it and they'll be less intimidated by that um, but it is you know it's basically smart code and there's you know a description of the nesting relationship and how it manifests in the in the full smart code and then um, people have said they found the next outline very clarifying if you can see it well enough but that's this nesting relationship again. On the left are the regional sectors. In the middle are the community units. And the community units are like containers for transect zones. And there you don't see the transect zones until you get to that third step. Yeah, and then um, on, the, on the far right are the elements that make up transect zones. You know, the park, parking location and the frontage standards and so forth. So, um, you know, it, just keep that in your head and, and you'll, have, you'll have that scale issue uh, straight. The, Sandy, could you uh -huh. read this out because you can't read it from a distance. Okay, this is, this is the first two yeah. articles and these are the regions which are sectors. Each sector is allowed to okay. have one or two. You want to read into that? Or I'll do it, I'll do it. I don't know if they can hear you back. Explain what, explain how, mm -hmm. because it can't be Yeah, right. yeah, it's article, well, article, um, two regional scale plans, has two open space sectors, and then uh, currently there are four growth sectors of increasing intensity. And you could think of this as a kind of transect. Um, and in fact, when you look at the standards for these sectors, they talk about the different kinds of landscape that, uh, you know, would, would enable you to choose one sector or another. These are, the, these are the sectors that appear in the bad plan. It would appear in the bad plans that 
like Baltimore County that she showed. But except the yeah. problem is that they're, instead of being called sectors, they're called transect zones. Yeah, that's really, that's really the, yeah, that's the only problem, but it has ramifications. Um, in, in the National uh, Community Character Manual, that um, their middle scale that, that's, that, no, their T-zone scale is actually pretty similar to what we have as the community unit scale. So where well, the community units contain T-zones, what they're calling transect zones are, you know, really, so it's a, Perfectly fine way to organize. It's just the name. So they, okay. They could fix it by changing the legend. Basically. That's what I suggested. Right. Yeah. So I'll try. All right. This is a very tiny computer. Um, so this is um, oh one the preserved open space sector, the reserved open space sector. This is. Uh, Restricted growth sector, G1, G2, controlled growth, G3, intended growth, and G4 is infill. And then um, in, in the um, next version, perhaps, I don't know what they're going to do, but um, we suggested G5 for, for sprawl repair sector. So that you can make a regional distinction between sprawl areas or even, you know, a, a, on a smaller um, level in, within municipalities, between sprawl areas and uh, infill that is traditional pattern. Get on with this. And this is a C CLD is the clustered land development. That's a hamlet. TND is a village. Um, RCD is, you know, a larger town um, or, or a, um, in infill RCD you'd have uh, like a downtown of a, of a large city. And the transect zones are more intense when you get up to these um, higher, where the the growth sectors are higher, the um, intensity of each community unit is higher, more urban, because of the T-zones that are allocated to them. So the RCD has T4, 5, and 6, whereas the TND has 3, 4, and 5. And right there, it, it calibrates down to a less urban type of community. You've always got three. Is there four? Yeah. Yeah, Matt's going to talk about why many people think we need more. Yeah, but yeah. also, there are actually eight here, but, you know. One more thing. Each of these is intrinsically diverse already. And so you have diverse, you have also nested diversity. Okay, but each of these are diverse. But there's also one thing, when, when Sandy says this is more intense, if there's another table that says there's a higher percentage of T6 here. There's also a higher percentage of the land that's T6. This is the same T6, it's the same zoning category, this T6 and this T6, right? But there's more of it here. So this is exactly like Chinese cuisine. There's a huge menu where there's pre-chopped only six ingredients. You see what I'm saying? And that's what's so efficient about it. And each of the ingredients is complex. So this is just a celery. It's a celery that has already been slightly pre-cooked with a little pepper. And what the efficiency is that all the complexity has been designed in by the code. So all you have to do is throw it in and very inexpensively arrive at a complex code. So you need a walk. <laughs> so in my reading, I found uh, this quote from 2003, another early one, where he's very clear about it, right? I mean... There, there are neighborhoods in cities, and uh, I know Dan Bartman uh, questioned this, and correctly so, that in existing cities you'll find complete neighborhoods that are, um, that are only two T-zones. Or they might have sub-zones of T4 and T5, something like that, uh, but they wouldn't have any T3. And in, in the smart code, in fact, for infill, there are no allocation percentages. It's real, this, is a, this is a comment about doing a, a greenfield project or, you know, brownfield, whatever, that's large enough that you are going to be able to allocate that much diversity to really have three major habitats, at least. And um, here's how the transect is fractal. It, this, this drawing overlaid on the um, regional plan for Western New York from, what was that, 19... 
Yeah, 26 by Andrew Von Marr. And um, there is a regional transect, right? But it's not the transect that's used within those purple areas. The purple areas are the community units. You know, this is a town, this is a hamlet, this is a city or town. And as this regional transect gets farther from, you know, the flat areas that you can develop more easily and um, the land that's not as good for timbering or grazing and so forth, that's going to change the intensity of the community unit. We call it a community unit in the smart code because the word community by itself has so many meanings to people that those can be different scales too. We needed a regulatory term. So the community unit and these technical, you know, acronyms TND and RCD are what we use. Can you speak a little bit about that? Okay. Yes. The terminal, one thing that's very important in the transect is that there's a, there's a translation protocol of terms. People will say, this will never work in California because we don't do TND. We do sell. There's a translation page that, that actually picks up all the varied nomenclature that actually means exactly the same thing. Yeah, you just have to get to that page and then just do, basically just exchange it throughout the code. That's the first thing you do. The first thing you do is you use local nomenclature. Now, something that actually is very uh, a very interesting scene here. The valley section of Gettys is also the water the watershed. This is so the environmentalists are also now thinking in terms of entire watershed. The, the transect is an environmental term. It became, it, it emerged directly from environmentalism. It is actually the instrument that we're, that we're intending to use to bridge environmentalism and urbanism because it's the same technology. Okay? And every environmentalist knows what the transect is. Most urbanists don't, but the environmentalists do. So that's a huge common concept. We could have written this code, instead of using zones, instead of T-zones, we could have used habitat. Because we're talking about exactly the same thing. What is symbiotic? What degree of mixed use, what degree of lighting, what kinds of trees, what width of sidewalk is a symbiotic habitat? And we have to call it very early on. Are we gonna plug into environmentalists by using entirely environmentalist te technology like habitat terminology, or are we going to plug into the planning departments and keep them calm and safe sounding by calling them zones? And we made the decision that at the moment, at that time, the planning departments were more powerful. The 27,000 planning departments were more powerful. If you've been out there anywhere in the real world, you'll know that the planning departments are being given the complete runaround by any environmentalist with a, with a, with a calling card printed yesterday. <laughs> the whole power shift has shifted to environmentalism in the last 10 years. And we could rewrite this code entirely with environmental terminology of things like patches and corridors and habitats. And I think it would be a huge aha moment. And then the environmentalists, of which there are many millions of, would come in and actually do our work, and we could actually go have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of fighting everybody all the time. Let's do it. They could actually just fight for us. But I think yeah. we need to make that translation so they understand. Yeah, I talk about transect zones as habitats <laughs> in lectures constantly. Yeah, it's really effective. I, I mean, just you know, regular people. They don't have to be environmentalists. Okay, they like it. Correct. Yeah. These, are, these are these are sectors. Yep. Okay. This is one of the correct ones. That's yep. a sector. That's oh, this is correct. Yeah. Over two or three. They're not transect zones already. Right. One thing that's confusing is is that the sectors look and operate sort of like a transect yeah. across the region, it's, but but they're but they're entirely yeah. different. Yeah. Because you go from 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 the the. the, the can the can you stand up so they can hear you back there? Yeah. Their web. It's deep room. <laughs> so, so the um, what was was sort of confusing there is that you go from the rural sectors to the to the urban sectors. So if you, when you're in a rural place in in the region, you're basically in a place that has the absence of human settlement. And then you go to uh, places which are principally uh, human settlement or almost entirely human settlement. So we're talking though things that fit into these containers, which still go from rural environments to urbanized environments, are actually neighborhoods, towns, cities. Within those, each one of those units is the transect. So the diagrams are yeah. very similar. But you know, I yeah. have to say one thing. It's the fact that this fractal, and by the way, it also works in architecture. You can have rustic material and finished material. You can get the same stone and make a terrace and polish the stone and make a living room. 
But for me, that's a confirmation that we're onto something really great. Because it's the same as the planets and the atoms. Why do they have to, why no one's confused between a planet and an atom? Right? You know, because this is electrons and that's a planet. But for me, that's a confirmation that it's the same thing occurring. It's the same system of order occurring at the at the levels. And it should we shouldn't fear the confusion. It's actually a confirmation of its elegance. Because remember, the theory is it is the most elegant explanation that confirms the the, the truth of the theory. And this is a very elegant thing because it is practical. But the only fear of the confu confusion is then you lose precision, which is also important. No, the but, fear is that yeah. every idiot has to understand it. <laughs> yeah. um, so th these purple areas represent, you know, community units, uh, sectors, excuse me. Um, no, these purple areas represent community units, and within them, this is the planning that you do with the transect zone. So that's the full plan I showed you half of before. Um, the Florence Gardens, and each of those circles is a pedestrian shed, so that's very fine grain. Uh, here's, I'll just show you a couple more like that. This is um, Socher, Mississippi, uh, planned by Andrews University. This won a student charter award uh, for their smart code and plan, and interestingly, the model smart code is to be locally calibrated and the DNA for the code comes from either the community itself or another community. In this case, there was, there was no community there with, with urbanism. It was just a little loose hamlet. And they chose another Mississippi city for the synoptic survey, which is the urban analysis, to be done. So they chose Bay St. Louis and Ocean Springs. And the teams went down and did their measuring and analyzing got the DNA from those two places and coded it for what they were expecting an influx of, uh, after Katrina, an influx of 10,000 population into this area. So this is what they're planning for. And uh, I just want to show this one because I think it's, you know, it's another post-disaster instance. And I don't think a lot of new urbanists know about this, but uh, Gonzalo is here at CNU. So if you find him, you know, get him to talk to you about it, but, and he could show you all eight of these Chilean smart codes that were done immediately after uh, the earthquake and um, tsunami there. And uh, again, there's the pedestrian shed. You can see the scale. This is an old mining town that runs along a ridge. Um, and just quickly, I'm just trying to infuse, you know, the scale at which we work in photographic terms. Yeah, the um, transect collection is available that was uh, posted uh, fairly recently on the CATS website, which is transect.org, um, through the images page, or you can go directly to the transect collection, which is over 500 images of mine that I had a previous life as a photographer and, and um, now I'm melding the two lives into, I had a wonderful time putting this together. Um, but it's transect-based, completely uh, images of different elements that you may want to use. It's open source, again, um, and that's transect-collection.org. So there are images like these that they don't have a lot of people in them, but they're analytical. <laughs> so this is New Orleans, by the way. Um, just to show you, you know, here's the scale we're talking about. And in this one, it's interesting, when I went back and looked at this, I'm like, the one on the left, actually, that isn't all T6 in there. That's too, I, I'm up in the hotel 20th floor or something, so that's too high to get only one T zone in there. It's, it's finer grain. There's, there's T5 in there, too. Uh, but the one on the right is T6 in the context of, in, in the context of the New Orleans rural to urban transect. Um, this is Andrews University also, another charter award winning plan, and this was for the Bahamas, um, South Abaco. And I just want to show you again, this, they've applied the sectors, the regional sectors, you know, all these colors. The next slide will be a regulating plan for a part of this area, and the regulating plan is for just this little tiny piece right here. So that's that. Okay, so big scale difference. And there's the, their beautiful transect that they did. By the way, it's amazing how 
every single year graduating of Andrews, these are undergraduates. And they're completely so they're completely, completely competent, you know, zoning and coding and doing our urban architecture and so forth. It's a remarkable thing. And every year they actually read the the uh, school award every single year. And it's one professor, a few students, but a real discipline. And that you know you know when you have a discipline when it's teachable. When you have a kind of general idea and the students come out all over the place, yeah. you haven't got a discipline. Yeah. The, the professor is uh, Andrew Von Marr, who uh, did that diagram of the region I showed you. And he was a student of Philip Best at Notre Dame. And they also do wonderful transect base plans. They'll come in second. <laughs> Not every year. <laughs> uh, and this is a sector plan by DPZ of 80 square miles. Um, and the, it, you may not be able to see in the slide, but uh, the ped sheds are, the community units, excuse me, are, are sketched in there, but there are 48 community units um, that they plan for over this, this huge area. That, that's uh, a Toyota plant was landing in the middle of it, and they were the just going to have all this. Uh, yeah, that's the Toyota plant, the purple. So what do we do to make it clearer or, you know, Andres doesn't think it's that much of a problem to have this confusion out there, but um, a lot of people say that the diagrams that are, you know, at, have been out there are giving the wrong impression in terms of, you know, can't tell what scale they are, you know, what would help, what types of diagrams. I added these, these little tents, you know, kind of containers for the T-zones for each of our community, main community units. So that was one idea. Can I, can I yep. just go back to one? Yep. By the way, the, the, one of the reasons that there are three people that are actually experts at community types. Peter Calfork and Doug Calvo are sitting over there, the TOD. And when it's not TOD, which because transit won't get there, it's called RCD, a regional center. So this RCD is a regional center, and think of it as a town. TND is the old Florida term, traditional neighborhood development. And think of it as a village. CLD is Randall Aaron's cluster. Think of it as a as a as a, as a as Hamlet. A Hamlet. Yeah. Okay, so you see what the code what this code does. No one that's a good guy is left out. So long as you change the terminology, because all the good guys are talking about the same thing. The Canadians have a term. The Californians have a term. And that's what the the translation. What do, what do we call it? The uh, where the different terms are sitting next to each other. Synonyms? The synonyms. There's a synonym page that brings everybody in. Now, yeah. The reason we do LCD instead of doing Hamlet, TND instead of Village, and RCD in terms of, uh, instead of doing Town Center, is that they're the most neutral. They're the ones you're most likely to, to, to replace with your local terminology. But almost immediately, if you feel comfortable, just change this to Hamlet, Village, and Town. Mm -hmm. And it'll just work. Yeah, and people change the T-zone names too. They're, you know, that's the model, and they get they get customized. And a lot of places they don't like the word urban, so they call it, you know, something else, neighborhood or village or something like that. Um, another idea was, well, gee, maybe if we stretched out um, T2 and T1, and thanks Dan Bartman for the help with T2 here, um, if we doubled them, it, you know, the, the diagram wouldn't become too wide, we could still fit it on a page, and maybe that would help show that the urban transect, T3 through T6, is meant to be compact. So, uh, you know, I don't know. It still may look like all of that could be on the regional scale. I'm not sure if that helps or not, but it was just an idea. Um, now, why, why are people so taken with the idea of a regional transect and using the transect at the regional scale? And my regional planner friends tell me, um, Jennifer Hurley and Bruce Donnelly have been talking about this for, for years, that um, there is a real need for something like that at that scale. And the sectors aren't enough for them. Uh, they need some other way to plug in the policies um, and services that, that are needed. And so Jen, uh, we, the three of us work together on this some, um, but this is really Jennifer's, um, the fractal transect. She was here earlier. I think she got hungry. And um, uh, so I'll try and explain this. But, but 
So you can read what it says there, and then this table that she did, and here's the second page. Uh, that's just a blow up of one, one section. And so it's got all the different services that you would need throughout a region or throughout a you know, municipality. And you can plug them into um, these general ideas that are very familiar to, to people. They're very familiar to regional planners to think this way. Rural services are at one level, suburban at another, and urban at another. And then she shows which of the sectors in the smart code, you know, are kind of included in them. So you, this is the beginning of a regional transect of being able, able to code it. The protocol to determine the sector, open space one, open space two, uh, low growth, higher growth area, comes directly from GIS. So you have all this GIS information, 20, 30, 40, 50 confettis. But from the point of view of operation, from the point of analysis, you have something like 50 colors. From the point of view of operation, you only need something like six. Because for example, there may be many, many colors that have to do with water and riparian and purchased open space and so forth. <coughs> but as far as you're concerned, those are areas that you can't build on, period. You can't build on them. It might be 17 or 20 GIS categories and you can't build on them. So that's just a one. And then there's a whole series of other, of other areas that actually you shouldn't build on them but you actually have the right to build on them, right? You should have a right to build on them. So we're worried about these, and those are O2. And they may consist of 15 GIS categories. And then finally, the urban areas, which where you want infill, may be six types of urban areas, and they consist of, you know, G5. So this, this open space and G4 plugs into the GIS protocols, and I can't emphasize yeah. both how potentially useful and currently useless GIS is. It just basically, when you do a GIS analysis, you show it to the people and you say, look how much I know, trust me with your fate. <laughs> because that's all it serves for. It, it, it. And this makes it all operational. And immediately, like for example, Elliot Allen, within two or three days, can do Southern Mississippi, which he did. Uh, Incredibly efficient. Speaking of GIS, um, Emily and I are giving a look, uh, tomorrow, Two o'clock. There's a session called Across the Transect, and it has four different um, presentations. And they didn't list out the the presentations separately because they're little short ones. But they should have because uh, two of them are for, by people from Miami. One of them's talking about composting using the Miami 21 Transect based code. Um, another one uh, presentation will be on. These are little short ones, like seven minutes long. Um, the other one is on pre uh, historic preservation, how that's working out with Miami 21. Should be interesting to a lot of people. Uh, there's um, one presentation on uh, the Galapagos and using a transect there. And then Emily and I are doing one on, um, she's, we're geeks and grounders, she's the geek, and we're, she's gonna talk about GIS, transect analysis at the regional scale, and then, um, and then I'll do a bit on, you know, on the ground, how we plot around neighborhoods, measuring and taking photographs, and um, hopefully these two systems will connect in an elegant manner. So that's tomorrow. Um, so just a few more diagrams showing, or, or tables, you know, showing the relationship of the T-zones to the community units, to the sectors, and this was, you know, DPZ did this one when we were starting to go towards version 10. So I don't know if you're still uh, on this or not, but it, it's just to show, you know, to make it more clear. But of course, you have to open the smart code to see that. And if you're using the transect without the smart code, you might never see it. These are by um, these are blow-ups from, you know, much more complex uh, tables by Hoyt Cousins, architect in Denver, and he's been working very, very carefully on ways to help people, you know, kind of understand these and on these um, kind of templates to fill in um, po for the possibility of such things as connecting to lead ND or so forth. So there's a lot of good ideas in, in the graphics um, that different people have been playing with. So this is Hoyt's also. And that is it. We have three links. Uh, that's the CATS website. 
then the transect collection, the photographs I mentioned, and then the third one is the code study that Placemakers has on one of their websites. Um, and this is where you can go to look at how many form-based codes and transect-based codes and smart codes um, have been adopted or are in process at this time. So um, next we have, Andres, did you want to show some images? We, we will finish and then rush out to lunch before the 2 o'clock, thanks. Yeah, okay. There's a whole set. Okay, what you didn't get today was the solid meal of how the smart code and the transect works. Okay, this entire presentation is peripheral to the central document. Those of you who know the central document, this will make a lot of sense. Those of you who don't, you have to get to the central document and see see what the center of this planetary system that you're looking at. Okay, now one of the things that I want to show is uh, what calibration looks like. And uh, we're preparing a book of essays. There are some 15 quite, I would say, almost academic and intellectual essays on the transect and the smart code, for example, like Emily's, over the years. And we've collected them in one book. We've also collected, and to persuade anybody to buy that book, we've collected all the beautiful illustrations over the years. This is an early one. Uh, this is a DPZ. I think it was done by Seth Harry, and what I love about it is that it's so American. It is such a cartoon. Okay, this is the kind of thing that the completely infantilized American culture will understand. Don't show me anything complicated. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is one, actually somebody mentioned that this was actually a 19th century one. I think somebody said this, uh, Dan showed it. That's a real compliment. This is three years old. And it was done by Eusebio Ascui in our office just means it's really good if you think it's 19th century. And it basically shows the natural transect. This is what the environmentalists study. And they see that there's a series of habitats called ocean, beach, uh, prime dune, uh, trough, secondary dune, back dune. And in each of these, there's a symbiotic system of trees and minerals and microclimates. And this is why the transect makes so much sense in terms of, bri in terms of bridging with environmentalism. Uh, this is one of the really beautiful, oh, by the way, this one was done for the project in Orlando, which was a competition that we didn't win, uh, the old Naval Training Center, what's it called, uh, Baldwin. Baldwin Park. This is what Baldwin Park, and by the way, it still looks quite a lot like this. You know, they didn't do, do our project, but it sure somehow the transect uh, 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 prevailed. And this is incredibly elegantly done. By the way, these are propaganda. Everything that Sandy showed you were technical drawings. These are the ones that actually explain and convince people that this is all very cool stuff. Never confuse a rendering with anything other than propaganda. That's what it's for. It's not a technical drawing. This is what I call a persuasive drawing or an illustrative drawing. Uh, this is one that Leo Creer did many years ago, but he didn't, do it. He didn't know it. This is a, one of his very earliest projects. Uh, I'm talking about the 1970s, and he did a, he fixed his town of Echternach, where he went to high school, and it's a big drawing like that. This is one of the amazing drawings of the 70s, because it was so detailed. By the way, Leo draws like this, and then blows it up. And I just took one slice, one slice from the drawing, and there was the transect. He had surreptitiously, or at least instinctively, done it. And by the way, you see this street that winds in? This became the skeleton for dozens and dozens of subsequent transect drawings. Like this one. This is also a kind of America. This is a rather lugubrious. I don't know why people keep showing it. And then this is one that was done to show the environmentalists have always been very skeptical about this. And I remember very early on, the very earliest transects had been added. T-zones were reversed, and actually it was T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, and T6. And the reason I did it that way is that I thought that there would be many different kinds of open space. That there would be T1 open space, I mean, you know, there would be T7, T8, T9 open space, I thought. But they said, no, I remember the early meetings when I actually would do what people told me. And they said, no, we come first. And I reversed it from T1 to T6 which actually is a problem. It really was a problem because 
there's no more higher than T6. T6 is the higher of the zones. So anyway, we're stuck with that. But this diagram was done to show the environmentalists that there's a lot more open space than there is urban area. That was a specific request by some friendly environmentalists. The transit is cross-cultural. This is one of the, this is the 100-foot scroll that you see in Taipei Airport as you walk down to pick up the things. And actually, it goes, this is four images extracted from a 100-page roll, and actually goes from rural to urban to rural again. And it's a way to actually show this is the way we Chinese do rural, this is the way we do, I'm sorry, natural, rural, this is how we do our suburbs, and this is how we do our town centers. It's always very satisfying to see that it's cross-cultural. Uh, this is incredibly interesting. This is the uh, Hawaiian transect. And in Hawaii, since it's all islands, it's always ocean and mountain. A hundred percent of Hawaii is ocean and mountain. And the way they orient is not north, south, east, and west. Because remember, you're, you're always going around. It's always the oceans on the right and the mountains on the left. But they call it Uka, mountains and uplands, Kula, plains and fields, and Kai. And their transect is called the Uka Kula Kai. And by the way, they had very primitive ancient drawings of this. They had really primitive crude drawings to explain this. They were trying to explain it to we poor foreigners. And we said, oh, we know exactly what you're talking about. I'm sorry, it's not this. It's sort of the Mauka Makai. That's what they call it. It's the Mauka Makai towards the mountain, towards the sea. And what happens is the mountain is always nature and the sea is always urbanized. That's it. And we just drew this for them. And you get these kind of shamans, these, these cultural protectors of Hawaii. And they love this. They absolutely love the clarity of this. And then they said, go ahead and get your permits. Uh, uh, the, the transect works also this way. Not only within the city do you calibrate New Orleans, but you can also calibrate across cities. Like, for example, this is New Orleans, Washington, San Francisco, and Miami. And you can compare the T3s, and you can compare the T4s. And it actually it becomes very clear that actually the suburbs of Washington are not like the suburbs of New Orleans, that the typologies are different. So this takes a huge amount of rather vague cultural political stuff and actually locks it in. Right now, Alex McLean, the famous aerial photographer, is doing a book on something like 24 American cities based on the transect. And we're working with them on it. It's a cat's pro pro it's, it's a cat's project, and they're absolutely beautiful and absolutely clear. And he's so excited because you know he's been looking at the American landscape all his life, and now it's as if he sees it for the first time. But it's a great analytical tool, not only you know within the city and across the cities. This is the first transect, uh, Humboldt, crossing from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Not only not only describing what's on the surface of the continent, but the atmospheric condition and the minerals. When he finished this, he took it straight to Thomas Jefferson. This is done in Chile. He went to Thomas Jefferson because as he figured he was the only other person on earth who would understand it. He had just read Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, which actually is also a verbal, it's a transect, if, but verbal. Uh, the transect of Patrigetes, which is also a watershed. It's one of the first ones that includes humans, not just nature. Uh, this is Ian McHarg. And this is one of the great explanations. You know, Ian McHarg's uh, design with nature, with the overlays, is the same system as the sector zone. That's another thing. The, the, o, the, the o zones and other zones, the, the protocol for GIS, is pure Ian McHarg. So you see how the smart code actually takes all the good guys, anybody who's a good guy, Ian McHarg, this, that, Gettys, and just pulls it all into a single operational document. So this is Ian McHarg's transect. This is an early, very confusing, this is one of the bad guys that caused the problem. See, this is the transect zone, but look how it was drawn. Sandy, I think you should show this as part of the infection. You're right. This infected, it's a DPZ drawing. We withdrew it, though. This is uh, Diru Tadani taking the standard transect and calibrating it for Washington, D.C. 
You see Washington with the diagonal. In other words, the typologies are actually Washington. And this is what he uses to explain to people in Washington. Uh, this is extraordinary. Do you realize that Stockholm has a transect-based code? And it's also it's one of the few municipal codes that is actually based on style, that's on context. It's a beautiful little book, and it was, it's been around for about uh, 12 years, and it takes 14 neighborhoods of Stockholm, and they can be translated into T3, T4, T5, T6. They don't use the transect zone. They, these preceded the smart code. But one of the things, and this is one way to think about this, there are two ways to look to code your city with an architecture of its time or an architecture of its place. If you, if you code an architecture of its time, which is to say you always make modern architecture, you gradually reduce the individual character because everything becomes modern. If you, if you do an architecture of its place, you reinforce the character. What's extraordinary about Stockholm is that this is the first city to put very large modern areas in. And they decided that that wasn't working out for them. They didn't want modern architecture everywhere. So in Stockholm, if you, when you build in Stenstad, it has to be Stenstad including the syntax. But on the other hand, if you're working in Aldreforstad or one of the night or, or Valley B, you can't go in and retrofit with neo-traditional. You have to work with the modern. And so in the end, I really very much like this because it means you can actually go from one place in Stockholm to another, and it's worth getting there because it's actually different. So this is a transect from Stockholm. This is beautiful in Williamsburg, and it shows you the, remember I was talking about the fractal nature of the transect, that the transect not only puts the region and the community in order. These are the fences of Williamsburg within three blocks of the, of, of the edge to the center. Look at how rural this is. It's all about cattle, okay? The, the, the cow comes up gets poked in the neck, got it. So this is very, very hostile to, to uh, this is almost a military situation. It hates humans, it's all about cattle. This is a split log. And notice it's not nailed. It's, it's held in a diagonal because there's a lot of space out there. It's cheap and it's rough and you don't, nobody's gonna touch it. It can have splinters. Now, as you get more urban, remember this is, this is the fence. You're walking in from the edge of Williamsburg, Virginia to the center. Here, you get the same split roll, but because in order to not waste ground with the, with the zigzag, it's vertical. Here, the lumber has gone to the mill. You can actually approach it with your clothing and not tear off your suit. It's more urban. And then, ultimately, it's the same thing for painting. And then this one went to the lathe. Obviously, more urban, more sophisticated. And then this one is brick, very sophisticated and then you have wrought iron. Do you realize that if you put wrought iron out there, it would be the kind of vulgarity you see in the Texas ranches? <laughs> because you know, you go to the Texan and the Texan says, you know, I bought these fences from Paris. And they're exquisite, exquisite fences. But you say, you are nevertheless a barbarian. But you're <laughs> right? You vulgar Texan. And the reason is he's just, just a transit violation. <laughs> That's all. And then you get the stupid uh, drugstore that is trying to ingratiate itself with its customers because the parking lot's so ugly. And they bring in a boulder and a fence like this. And I've seen this. There's one in Syracuse, New York. And you say, you can't believe it. And it's vulgar. And a lot of vulgarity and unhappiness and pitch is actually, they're actually transit violations. It's not just bad design. It's just the right, well-designed something in the wrong place. This is used to explain some people. We don't use this in Utah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so clear. Okay, this is Paris Hilton. Okay, if Paris Hilton wore this, she's, she's on the beach, you wear a bathing suit. No problem. Don't dress this way in Main Street. Can you imagine Paris Hilton on Main Street in a bikini? Immediate problem. On the other hand, you don't wear a transparent dress in the country because you frighten the natives, <laughs> right? But a transparent dress gets you into the nightclub in T6. And if you dress like this, you don't get in. 
So it's not a matter of actually saying you can't ever dress like this or like that. This is appropriate. Brad Pitt, the same thing. <laughs> okay. And by the way, I remember when I'm old enough to have been brought up to be told, and I'm still a little bit afraid of it, that in the city, if you were a, a gentleman, wear gray, black, and blue. And in the country, you wear brown. And don't ever wear brown in the city. And that's how incredible it was. And you, don't, you also don't wear black shoes in the country. And they just told me this. And even to this day, when I wear brown in the city, I think twice. <laughs> Should I do it? But then I realize nobody remembers anything, and it's OK to do whatever you want. These are all of the variables that the smart code, uh, uh, that the smart code, uh, the fundamental smart code, even without the modules that it deals with everything from livestock to domestic animals to deep setbacks to high level of service, low level of service standards, uh, how the parking is handled, opportunistic parking, dedicated parking. What you find is that there's a huge amount of decisions to be made, a huge number of decisions. What kind of parking, what kind of street width, what kind of lighting, what kind of everything. It's all listed here, and it is an absolute nightmare unless you have a taxonomic engine that puts it in place. And then suddenly everything clicks and coordinates. But there's another part, too. Most people try to write a single standard. Like, you can go to places in Florida that say, all sidewalks, I said, you have guys have sidewalks. Oh, yes, we have sidewalks everywhere. And tell me about your sidewalks. Well, they're four feet. I said, you're going to make a town with four-foot sidewalks? How about 18-foot sidewalks for the shops? And how about unpaved trails? So this works two ways. It takes the real complexity, puts it in order. And it takes the t trend towards hypersimplification <coughs> of the specialist and says, you're not allowed to write one rule. You have to write a minimum of six rules. If you're writing a rule, fine. Go to your room and write it. Bring it back. But I want the most urban condition, the most rural condition, and four in between. And once you give me this, it just plugs in automatically into this, what is really a taxonomic engine that you can code and administer and very efficiently. <laughs> if you think the smart code is very big, you have to imagine that it replaces about 30 separate manuals that are all sitting in the bookshelf and that are, 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 are uncoordinated. That's why it's a unified code. These are all the different terms. You know, the, the good guys, all the good guys have these terms. These are the traditional ones, city, town, village, hamlet, transit-oriented development, you know, the Cartier and so forth. So it coordinates the good guys. This is the environmental protocol that uh, Sandy alluded to, uh, which we call uh, the, uh, what's the analysis? Synoptic. The synoptic survey. How, how, does, how does an environmentalist analyze an open space? Okay. Do you, they actually go out and study every square foot and dig it up to see what's underneath and climb every tree to see what's happening on top and count every grasshopper? They don't do that. What they do is they identify typical conditions. They say, that's a typical condition, rock outcrop. That's a typical condition, woodland. That's a typical condition, wetland. And then they put, and then they put a, what's called a quadrant, which is, let's say, 100 by 100 foot boards out. Actually, it's more like 25 by 25. And they count what's there. It's this many butterflies, this much grass, this much this. And then they drill the hole to see what's underneath at 6 feet, 10 feet, 18 feet. And they show you where the clay level is and where the water table is and so forth. And then they look up and say, this is a humid area. And then they come back after having studied six typical places, and they have a perfect mapping of everything. Right? Extremely efficient. How does an urbanist do it? An urbanist walks out and says, I will analyze every single part of the city. I will walk every street. I will draw, I'll build a model, I'll draw everything from the air, I'll, I'll look at 30 GIS things. Well, one cost $25,000, one cost $2.5 million. And in the end, what you have is this incredible mass of complexity. It takes another $2 million to get down to what you need anyway, which are what are the rules that make it operation? Right? What are the rules? So the system, and this, by the way, is called, this is what the environmentalists do. They do a, they do a synoptic survey. They analyze and they identify, for example, woodland, right? And then they go in and they see what's, and then they put the quadrant on it and they count what's on it. 
and then they go down and they go up. And then they multiply that, they extrapolate, and they get the study. This is what we suggest you do. We suggest you do a synoptic study in public. You say, you get an aerial foot photograph, and you ask the citizens, look, we need to do a Main Street. What is your very favorite part of Main Street? And they study it to give you two or three. And then we say, you know, we need some suburban single-family house. Which is the very best suburban single-family house? Which is the very best quarter store? So instead of analyzing everything, you use the public process to identify, to identify the paradigmatic instance. And then you go out, and when you walk around, you see it, you smoke cigarettes, drink coffee, it's really a delight. Just like the environmentalists do. They're out there being paid to be in nature. The urbanist is out there, uh, you know, walking the city and smoking cigarettes. It's perfect. And then two days later, you you come back and you've identified the paradigmatic instances, right? These are the six paradigmatic instances. And then you do a dissect, which is a cut from alley to alley, and you actually find all the heights and everything, and you do a quadrant, which is a block. You basically take a block and you count everything on it. How many doorbells, how many trees, percentage of pavement, number of people living there, and then you extrapolate from that. And then the code gets written from this, and there's a, there's a little protocol. Do you realize that two DPZers did a smart code for Edinburgh in two and a half days? Two and a half days, totally coded, and it was totally defensible, because when they said, what are you coding this setback? What are you coding this density? We didn't even have to do renderings. We'd say, come, I'll show you. And then you'd go out there and say, this is Ann Street. How do you like it? They go, perfect. Well, that's what the code's going to generate. I'm with you. You see the incredible efficiency of the system? And this is called the synoptic survey. And it all has, it all has, it's in the, it's in the, it's in the smart code manual, and it has all these protocols. You know, when we started doing this, we said, what this world needs is not, is not expensive planning. It is really inexpensive planning. Another thing about the transect, which is so interesting, is not only that it goes from center to edge, it's actually successional. You see this street of T1? Yes, it's at the edge of the city. But you realize that T1, you realize that this street here, this town center, used to be that. It was just a street in the landscape. And what's interesting about the transect zone is that T1 over time becomes T2, and T2 becomes T3, and T3 becomes T4, and T4 becomes T5, and T5 becomes T6. It's not just spatial, it's sequential, which is exactly like nature. Have you seen these famous diagrams of nature that's successional, in which grassland becomes early forest, becomes mature forest, and then becomes climax forest, like that? It is absolutely analogous. And what happens is, when you finally reach climax forest, or you reach T6, the ideal condition, that's when the preservation module kicks in. Remember, so look, the city keeps molting, it's allowed to go, and the smart codes actually says, every, and it's your choice of year, every 10 or 15 years, every transect zone automatically becomes the next successional transect zone, unless in public meeting you decide not to. So there's a complete densification protocol that goes in, which after all is what urbanism is about. Now, have you ever heard of any code that actually has an automatic successional protocol? No. What you have is people coming in trying to get variances. Saying, can I please have an apartment in the garage? You know, can I please, uh, can I please have a, an illegal, you know, I'm working illegally in my garage. And so instead of saying, yes, we're going to give you spot zoning, spot zoning, spot zoning, we say, wait until the next transition, and we'll have a comprehensive, intelligent discussion as to whether you go to the next transit zone. And one thing about the transit zone, in the smart code, they're not only, they're not only uh, uh, parametric, they're not single numbers, they're parameters of numbers, but all the parameters overlap. So T3 overlaps slightly with T4, T4 with T5. So moving from one transit zone to the next is not an absolute difference. It just intensifies, so for example, you can rent one room Two, you can have an eight-room bed and breakfast in. It doesn't automatically go, you can rent one room and you can have a 200-room hotel, therefore everything gets demolished. And it absolutely simulates 
very, very closely organic development. Okay. There are all sorts of intellectual things you can write about. You can also do, by the way, you can do very, very easy transit zone from aerial photography. This just takes a couple of hours. You know, the T-zones the of Pienza. Uh, and you can, uh, there are also open spaces that you can, uh, this is the agricultural transect, from hand-tended agriculture to window boxes to tractor farming. And here you actually, and, and chickens. One of the things you find about the transect zone is that when you're in public process and somebody says, and there's a disparity of, uh, of requests, like somebody wants dark sky and somebody wants a nightlife, you can't say you're wrong the way it always happens. Like, you know, the dark sky people are saying the people who want a very lit Main Street are wrong. That's not a tenable position for an American planner. An American planner cannot ever say that an American is wrong, right? Everybody is always right. What you can say is, we will make a place for you, and we will make a place for you. If you want to have bright sky, absolutely, it's called T6. If you want to have dark sky, absolutely, it'll be T6. And you're sitting there, instead of being beaten up by contradictions, you're sitting there like Solomon. Yes, allocating. The smart code allocates. It doesn't ban. And by the way, it drives some people nuts, because it allocates some really bad stuff as well. You know. The proper uncalibrated un, um, un, uh, smart code, if you do it straight, will allow some sprawl, will allow some uh, drive-through, because that's what the world's like. Uh, very quick transects. I think I actually have the wrong presentation. Okay, no, I'm sorry. You can also organize plan books. You know all these plan books of cheap plans? We, there, there's at least two of them that are transect-based. These are pre-permitted drawings. Uh, other transects by different hands. Beautiful transect of Jamaica. By the way, this is amazing. You know what this is? This photograph is actually NASA in the Bahamas. It's an absolutely perfect transect. We just extended it and then put nature in it. And we, you know, we showed them, this is you. And then we redrew it and said, and by the way, you, need, you, you want a T6, it will go right here. And so it was really their calibration. This was the transect of the Bahamas. Okay. So now, what's the deal? We go to lunch. Uh, no. we, we have Discussing. like just a little bit of uh, a little bit of time where we can discuss. Okay. I can rush through this stuff. No, no. I think course. yours is the big deal. You wanted the Panzer too, right? Not necessarily, but Panzer. but don't you have all sorts of cool stuff? All the tables and that sort of stuff. Okay. I wouldn't try to squeeze Matt in because that's the new technology. And that's really what some of us are here for, including me. So can we do that after lunch or not? There's another session in here at 2 o'clock, I guess so. So we're not going to have lunch at all? I'm sorry, you confused me when you said that it was lunch in between. No, that's not what you said. It was lunch oh. after this session oh, before okay. the next one. I thought we were going to take a lunch break. Sorry. No, no, we don't get no, that. No, we have to rush out and get a sandwich if we're going to the 2 o'clock session. I thought session. that was between two sessions of ours. No, not of ours. Okay. We're already into our second part of our Okay, got it. Okay, so I'll, I'll only somewhat rush. No, no, we're going we're gonna to stay and, and go through the rest of this, and then, then there's a break. So um, I'll somewhat rush through it, but if you need clarification on things, just sort of speak up. Um, one, one thing, Sandy was getting into it, but the, the most important thing to consider is that community units are such a critical part of the smart code and the transect that if you're not using them, you're just doing it wrong. And if you don't understand them, understand them. Ask questions. You need to understand them. Uh, one thing that was that, that brought me to a lot of the work that I've been doing lately on this was that uh, I think a year a year and a half ago, um, Andreas uh, uh, told a couple of us that he wanted us to analyze Kelthorpe systems of place types and figure out how we can fit that into the smart code. Right? Um, I just don't think it works because his systems are confused as to what scale they are. They're, they're different sizes. Uh, they include multiple transect zones in different places, so they don't really fit very well. So this was the initial thought that, you know, we could sort of pop it into RCDs, TNDs, CLDs, you know, the various types of community units we have. Uh, and then I analyzed it by uh, transect zones. And I said, well, you know, there's really not a scale to it. It's, we really need to be rigorous about the community units. Notice how Calthorpe has all the ugly colors. <laughs> and the TNDs have all the elegant colors. <laughs> So um, one of the best diagrams for this is Tom Lowe's diagram of, of how, you make, how you make a town, how you make a city. 
And uh, really what you don't, what, you, what people miss in this is that the pot, that pot is the community unit, right? So you need the pot in order to cook the meal. So, um, but we've known this for a while. Uh, Career has shown us, you know, in the past that, um, you know, these are, these are uh, DC, these are the neighborhoods of DC. Um, so it's really important to understand that these neighborhoods are distinct and they have a different character and they have different intensities. So uh, I started analyzing cities recently and said, well, there's two types of uh, community units. There's associative, you know, the ones that like to be next to each other, and those build a city. And then there's dissociative, the ones that need to be away from each other. So the associative types are things like metropolitan centers, you know, the center of the city, and those tend to have a, uh, a lot more gravity to them. They have a lot more mixed use jobs. So they actually have a longer pedestrian shed. You know, people will walk 10 minutes, 15 minutes in order to get to their daily needs. So it really just doesn't fit specifically the five minute. There's more pedestrian sheds. Uh, we have urban neighborhoods. Urban neighborhoods are really important to, uh, to distinguish from standard TNDs. So right now we say RCD, TND. Well, really, there's an in-between, which is when you have a, a, a traditional neighborhood that's next to the city center, it tends to be much more intense. It tends to have a lot more mixed use in it, too, because you have a lot more people. So this is a different type, and people can tend to walk further within it. Uh, then you have the traditional neighborhood. The traditional neighborhood is what we understand to be T&D. That's what we think of as the typical American neighborhood. This one is in, um, in Ohio, but it's sort of the perfect example of, uh, of what fits within the five-minute walk. But one thing that uh, Andreas had pointed out before, which I think is particularly interesting here to point out, is that these inner city neighborhoods, the neighborhoods that are within urban areas, have a lot of the retail to the edge. This is the center of the neighborhood, but here's the, you see? Yeah. So when, when you're in the city, the neighborhood still exists within this, uh, in this case, this five minute shed, but the retail and services are at the edge of it. And that's. Yeah, the school's at the center, there's a church at the center, there's a few shops there actually as well. Um, but that differs from when you get outside of a city and, and neighborhoods are separate from each other. And those are the ones that tend to be centric. So we, we've had this diagram for a long time which shows how a number of neighborhoods, here's one neighborhood and another, come together in an urban environment and create a city. So if you analyze a place like Chicago, we can say, you know, at the edge outside of the center, here's a number of neighborhoods that are defined within five minute walks and between them are the corridors and the corridors where the intensity is, right? <coughs> but these neighborhoods are also of differing intensity. So this one here and this one here, are obviously more urban than the neighborhoods up here. So I think we need to make this distinction between those two types. Uh, because when you analyze it, you say, well, okay, these are the neighborhoods, but these are also um, areas of influence. This is where the, most of the um, mixed use happens, right, at those corners. So we need, we need to basically have a different type of analysis for urban places, for cities. And this is very controversial in the new urbanism. Yeah. There are people who think that, could you just go back, there are Australians and Brits that think that this should be the neighborhood center. Very strongly, I feel it. And the Americans feel that this has to be the neighborhood center. But the reason is that these are such violent places in America. You know, the, the speed is so, yes, of course, the shops are there. But they're so unpleasant that you have to really bring in. For social reasons, no one would willingly hang around out there. And so it probably in gentler places like Melbourne and so forth, you can actually be, you know, your neighborhood center can actually be at the edge. And, but there's a huge right now. Uh, the way I come out in this fight, if you look at the lexicon, I draw it both ways. And I call it the, the Australian method. You know, and I, we've even developed criteria that say that if you have any more than a yay number of cars per day or a yay number than, of lanes, then you better have your neighborhood center in the middle because you're going to end up with something like you know, the boulevard. You know the terrible boulevard we have here? Who, who would designate that a town center? Well, in Australia, that would automatically be you do. You yeah. have a you <coughs> do so that. I understand it gets vicious, it's half a circle, because that's so you, and you only get half a pet shed to walk to that to drive to support. So then we have the pet shed going backwards, you know. Yeah. yeah. But see I think if you look at the lexicon, it has three models. It 
never has one model because the world is complex. But here it is very clearly. By the way, in Chicago, it's likely that this could be the neighborhood center. I'm not sure, but. I, 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 I think it depends on how people associate, what they associate as a neighborhood. Yeah. So most likely the people you know, within this circle say, you know, these are my neighbors, and I walk to the shops at the edge. Uh, just like in that um, prior example in Ohio. Right? Yeah. Uh, but what's also in, in the prior discussion really important to understand is that you know, the transact operates here, and this one may be different from this one. Right? And it, that happens even at that close proximity. So then the other types are the dissociative types, the, the types that like to be away from each other. And these are essentially what we understand to be uh, rural types of, uh, of development, those being uh, towns. And towns are really interesting because they operate differently than most other neighborhoods. They tend to have a larger center than you would find in a typical neighborhood. And they actually don't have, you know, a town doesn't have a series of neighborhoods that make it up like a city does. A town itself has a main center and people actually settle much further from that center and they're willing to walk further but that's just, um, you know, that's due to the location and, and the, the intensity of settlement. Uh, then you have villages. Villages tend to be smaller, smaller than neighborhoods. And that's a five-minute? That's a three-minute walk, actually. I, I did some analysis of a lot of different villages in the Midwest, and they tended to be around a three-minute walk. Um, and then we did a lot of an analysis of uh, how different types of community units uh, are built uh, based on intensity. So if you look at each of these, and I'll probably present this a little bit more in detail places, next year. Are these real places? These are real places. These are, these are the studies uh, in Utah. But basically, each, each one of these is, uh, is a neighborhood or a regional center or a city center. But if, if it's legible, you can see where the, darker, um, you know, where the darker boxes are is the higher intensity area. And then it goes out to the lighter boxes. So you have a huge variety within that. But we use that to calibrate. Um, to calibrate the, the mix of T-zones within different neighborhoods and different neighborhood types. And we also use that to create different types of pedestrian sheds. We said, well, here's the standard shed, and the smart code generally codes for that, and it also codes for the, uh, the long shed, sorry, the, the standard shed and the long shed, the long shed being a 10-minute walk associated with very urban places, uh, and then also the linear shed. So what I've done is, is uh, analyzed the linear shed to a degree and coded that so it has a certain degree of flexibility in, in, in how, it, uh, how it's applied the in its length. Is Main Street. Yeah, the linear shed is Main Street. But what's interested in Main Street, what's interesting is that Main Street isn't all one intensity along its entire uh, course. It, it waxes and wanes in, in intensity. So it's actually a series of centers connected. So uh, there's a bunch of things that we've been doing uh, modifying the code. And um, we've been working on this. Uh, we've been working with uh, placemakers back and forth on this as well, and, um, and with some others. Rick Hall today just uh, informed me that he applied some of these new uh, tables in transportation to a code that he's doing. So we're going to take his feedback and modify that back into version 10 stuff. Um, a lot of these tables that I'm going to show you have been applied in Ranson uh, with Jen Hurley and Susan Henderson. So um, one thing that I found in the existing code is that we have a lot of tables that are just definitions, but we can actually turn those, you know, we want to regulate these things, but right now we're not regulating them. So in this case, you see we have uh, the, the frontage table, right? This is how the building meets, uh, meets the street. So the frontage table here gives definitions and then uh, locations and T-zones, but it doesn't actually give regulations. So we've converted this to say, well, what is it that we actually want to regulate? for each of these frontages. So we say, uh, what's the depth? What type of elements are permitted there? What can encroach? Uh, how is the surface treated? Uh, the last one's actually really important because you'll find previously that in, in a T4 zone, if you had a business on the ground floor, you were actually prevented from having a paved frontage, right? So you had to have grass, which was really odd, but that was just the landscape standards being separate from the frontages. So we sort of pulled them all together into one place. And then lighting, so we've always had where lights fit in the transit zone, and then just a general blank for specifications. Well, there's other things that I've found in practice are actually more important to regulate for lights, uh, and that's the height and spacing of the lights, right? And that varies by transit zone. 
So when you're in a more urban place, you tend to have more than just the fact that you have a double column or a single column. The lights are closer <laughs> together, and the heights are taller. And when you get to less urban places, the lights are lower, and the spacing is further. Uh, we also took the, uh, the table, this is the existing use table, and we sort of folded uses together that were uh, duplicated and streamlined the table here. By the way, the old table, just so you know, that old table is the APA table. So it's put in order. And the reason it may be duplicated is the APA likes that kind of stuff. Yeah. But we found out that, that as far as the uses were concerned, since the world is the standard planner is about use, you know, it's use based. And we had better ideas for use. They really wanted the old use tables that they recognized. And so the smart code includes if you if you're gonna if you want to do standard APA stuff, uh, Matt, you might actually keep the old one in for, as a choice. Mm -hmm. It makes people comfortable. Yeah, that's fine. Well, one one thing that I thought I needed to take out of it though were the building types, and building types were still in the uses for residential, and that was the main thing that I had a problem with that needed to be pulled pulled into. Um, multi-family, single family, and so forth. You know, it didn't really need to be detached, detached, it didn't matter. Uh, so the old parking tables uh, were this, the shared parking, uh, actually didn't have any way to, um, to be enacted with more than two uses, right? And uh, I believe that, um, that Rick Chalman, was it Rick who was working with the ULI standards to create this table, which allows you to, to take the general use categories that we have in the prior use table, and then analyze it by usage per day. And we've actually gone in the text and, and given instructions for how you do this. Use it per hour of day? Yeah, this is, this is um, the way this table works it are, are the number of parking spaces you'd normally be required for residential, office, and so forth here. And then you do an analysis of Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., 6 p.m. to midnight, and then midnight to 8 a.m. And then you do Saturday and Sunday uh, in the morning and in the evening. One of the things that you, you can also get a consultant for $45,000 to figure this out for you. And so you see, one of the things that happens with tables like this is that it allows middle towns who don't have the $45,000 to do it. But at the same time, you're very rarely going to find a parking consultant who says this is any good because it puts them out of business. But it's derived from reports we have had from parking consultants. And so you always get that, that kind of mesh in these people like Todd Zimmerman who does the marketing. He's done so many marketing projects for us that I already know what, this pro, what the result is gonna be. But if you ask me, he, he'll say, oh, it's always wrong, or that doesn't work. But it actually does, it's just not good business. So we always, we are, we'll always have opposition to simplification. Yeah, but it's super easy. I mean, you just have the That's number the that you required. By the usage, you figure out what's the highest. I know the problem is easy. But <laughs> demystified it. You know, they can take it out if they need to. Uh, and then, then the other thing is, in, in pretty much every PUD approval that I've had to do, I have to do off-street parking standards. So I just added them. I said, okay, if you want to know what the stalls are, that's fine. They're in the standards, but I'll put them here. Right? So we also um, went through and explained uh, more specifically how you calculate your required parking um, what is applicable, as in can you use the spaces in the front edge of the house as well as what's on the lot? Uh, what happens if, um, if you don't have a parking garage nearby? There is always this offloading to parking garages. Well, we're trying to fix that problem of if we have a block of, of lots and we want a parking lot in the middle, if you're doing greenfield work, that's, that, that can be owned by the uh, developer. But if you're doing infill, you actually have to have a way that the property owners can come together and make a shared parking lot. And so we're trying to solve those issues. Uh, and then also some of the elements that people, um, people don't really understand and haven't been diagrammed well, we, we decided to say, okay, well, these are great, but we actually need more diagrams. Like, how do the lot layers work? Where are they? Uh, what are the actual setbacks? Where are the frontages? Uh, this is a tree table from placemakers. So we took, they took the existing tree table and actually pulled in most of the specifications that you're going to need, like besides just the transect zone, what type of civic space is it appropriate for? And that's coordinated between the civic space types and transect zones. Um, and then, you know, what are the species and, and any other information, like does this drop nuts? So you can tell, well, maybe I shouldn't put this on the street. 
Um, but most of, most of the work that I did uh, was focused on trying to figure out how to get the thoroughfare assemblies um, to be uh, essentially figuring out a way to clarify that so people can actually build a frontage assembly. Because what we've done, and, and I think, Andreas, you were talking about the fact that initially you didn't have any instructions or any descriptions. And I found that the thoroughfares happen to be the same uh, in the smartphone where you say, well, just look at these tables and you'll figure it out. And, and that's fine if you know what you're doing. But for the people that don't know what they're doing, you need to write instructions. So before the smartphone said, oh, look at this table, this table, that table, you know, put them together and you'll figure it out. Which we can do, but, you know, other people can't. Uh, and then this one I thought is actually the source of a lot of confusion in the smart code. Because here we have the definitions for types of streets, but those types of streets are shown next to a frontage type, you know, next to how the sidewalk is configured. And so this sidewalk configuration here may work in T5 and not in T3. You know, so when it's all together on one table, it actually confuses things. Um, so first we try to demystify it. Well, what are all these pieces? So we did some drawings and said, well, this is where these elements are located. This is the private lot. Here's our thoroughfare assembly. That is made up of these three elements. And we've given instructions that say, if you're going to assemble this, you need to get this data from that table, put it next to this data from that table, take this data from that table and assemble the frontage and assemble the, uh, the thoroughfare. And then also for public frontages, we did the same. Uh, so this, in order to solve this table and the coordination of all the others, we actually rebuilt it. Um, here we have definitions, uh, IT classifications, and transit zones that these different street types are applicable for, right? So it's basically most of the first table just without the frontage joints. And then what we did was said, you know, all those other tables are just made up of these, uh, these data points. What type of frontage is allowed? How many lanes? What's the speed um, that's allowed? Do you have a median? Uh, do you have parking lanes? What's the width? So we put them all into a data table. Uh, and then one thing that really drives me crazy are roundabouts everywhere in the wrong place. <laughs> so in order to solve that, I said, okay, let's just get real and start to code intersections. Why not? So uh, here what we've done is taken standard intersection types, you know, T's, Y's, cross intersections, staggers, um, turbine plazas, traffic circles, square abouts, roundabouts, and then other civic spaces I just call elongated roundabout. Um, and we, we said, well, where are these appropriate? A traffic circle, that little one? That little traffic circle is appropriate in the rural areas. Don't put it in the city. In the city, you can use a square about or a roundabout or an elongated roundabout. And we say, well, for, um, for this roundabout, well, uh, what do we need to regulate here? Well, the radius needs to be 80 feet within the center and needs to be a civic space. You know, that's what you do in the city if you want to handle a large volume of traffic. So just like the prior table on the thoroughfares, we've gone through and said, uh, here's how you configure a, um, an intersection. An intersection has frontages, just like anything else. Um, and it has uh, essentially, uh, you know, is it striped or is it not striped for pedestrian crossing? That depends on what type of intersection it is where. Uh, and are there other requirements, like the, the minimum width of, of the roundabout, um, if you have medians and so forth, how they intersect. So we pulled that all into a data table. Uh, and then I, I thought this was really useful from a code that placemakers did. So I have started to integrate this, which shows you uh, what types of pedestrian crossings you should have, what type of, of uh, striping, right? So when you're in an urban area, the uh, T6, you have the most intense pedestrian striping. When you're in uh, <coughs> T1 or T2 or T3, you may have no striping. Uh, this one needs a lot of work, but what I'm trying to work out here is pulling in the idea of transportation provisions, which have, which have been in the code before, but they actually haven't been explained. Transit. And transportation transit. provisions, were they, they were called transportation provisions. They could be called transit, but bicycling is considered a transportation pr provision, so I keep it at that general term. But these give you rules as to what types of, uh, of facilities can be put in what zones and how you integrate them. So can you have separated BRT lanes or dedicated BRT lanes uh, and what zones they're appropriate in, what the sizes are, and so forth. 
And then we went through and fleshed out this table, which is the, um, the uh, public frontage table. Now, there's one thing you'll see, there's an extra column. There's one thing that was missing, which is the bridge. The bridge is the area where you're allowed to put things like signs, uh, fire hydrants, mailboxes, those sorts of things. So we added that for each of the different frontage types and one additional frontage type. But then we also took every single element within here and coordinate it with the rest of the tables in the code because there were some miscoordinations. Um, and just like the streets, we said we should probably explain what these frontage types are. What are the pieces? How do they come together? Uh, and then we, we adopted the format that uh, placemakers had come up with for how you actually put together a thoroughfare that has multiple frontages. So when it goes from transit zone to transit zone, we've never been able to solve that issue of how can you illustrate that. Well, you can illustrate it like this. You have a general configuration of the thoroughfare, and then in T3 it's like this, in T4 it's like that, and so forth. And we'll present more next year. <laughs> yeah. Can we ask questions? Yeah. I'm sorry. I, yeah. I just, um, I, I'm a planning director from a town south of Nashville, and I've come here, I'm not a member of CNU, but I've come here because of this transect. And uh, I wrote a development code for my city, and I'm in the nuance camp of the John Nolan type. And this complexity, this fractal complexity being shown, and, and to me as a planning director, this is all fractal complexity. Um, I, I went the other way with my code. I, I use the transect, but I've avoided a lot of the other stuff in smart code because of that complexity. And i got to ask you all the question. What if, say, assuming that new urbanism could work as you all uh, have, have created it on the market without any rules, because the market demands it, what if instead of this fragile complexity, what if we kept the transect, had five or ten rules that prop up new urbanism, or those five or ten rules that nuance that supports it, enables it? And leave it at that, because that's what I'm trying to do, and i got to ask. Okay, yeah. I have to ask a question. Do you have any lawyers? Yes. Okay. Yes. Do you have any lawyers? The original code, do you remember when you were here this morning when I showed the original code? Yeah. yeah. What made it this big? Yeah. What do you think made it that big? Oh, I get that, but I can still sell it to my city. Well, you can, there. but it's only going to remain that way. This is 20 years old. I began just where you started. And I'll tell you something, whenever we do a code that doesn't fill in with precision, somebody comes in and fills it in for us. Every single time, it's always junk. It's always junk. There is no such thing as a void in American planning. You can't leave it out. Now, it's going to be very easy for you to observe what happens if that code is going to increase. If you have incredibly intelligent, clear-thinking people, it will be a nice, organic code. But usually, it turns into a huge bucket of garbage. And when we're cleaning up codes, like the one you told me to clean up, yeah. that code, when it was written, it was actually a nice, clean little code. Yeah. It ends up in a bucket of garbage. Like, you know, how many categories does the Miami code have? I was only 25 years old. It had, like, I think, 263 categories. So the problem is we're trying to out, and, and I agree, by the way, I want to also say that I think we need to write codes just like yours, and we're dedicated to that, too. But we need to have both courses run. Every year it becomes more complex. The world goes through it. Can I, may I just ask them, what, can we have maybe some sort of, um, um, can, can we start to champion the approach where we just don't regulate that other stuff, in the, that, that other complex piece? Because our lawyers, at least in my town, and the hundreds of towns and thousands of towns like mine, 34,000 people. But, the, yeah. but, but do you think the traffic engineer is going to, isn't the public works going to tell you what the curb is and the urban sure. forest are going to tell you? See, the trouble is that somebody's always deciding anyway, and it's usually wrong. That's the problem. Yeah. No, we need, to, we need to do something, but the problem, see, you're only looking at replacing your codes. We're looking at replacing something like 15 and 20 separate books, including, by the way, the public works manual is not in here. The, the manual of the utility company is in here. The urban forester, the environmental rules are in here, the unified code. All, all I ask then, I guess, as a planning director or just yeah. uh, somebody on your side is if there's a way to even get more of that complex, to do that Twitter code, 
If you all can do that, because I'm trying to well, do I want to see your clip. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll want to right here. Yeah, you got it. But I just, yeah, yeah, we, that's, okay. as a planning director who <laughs> enables and enforces this legislation, that's what we need. That's what our community needs. Um, no, this, this has been passed around from Coder to Coder this morning, and this is by Andrew Burleson. It's called the Adaptive Code, an Idea Under Construction. Yeah. And he says, what's this? The Adaptive Code is a concept for a new way of regulating real estate development in the city. The code is meant to be simple and minimalistic. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, fine. So okay. Like, I, too, was 15 at one time. <laughs> okay? <laughs> no, no, all I'm saying is, all I'm saying is, yes, of course, that's the way it should be. Do you know what the Spanish law of the Indies said? Yes. You know what it said? Don't allow any lawyers into your city. <laughs> because they'll ruin everything. And that's a code category, code 43. And that's the problem. The problem is that, of course, this idea of I would love to sit and write these over there. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? But at the same time, I mean, who's kidding who? The place is absolutely chock full. I'm in complete shock at what happened to, this, to our smart code in Miami. Mm. It's like you've got to be kidding. You know, it ended up being six times bigger than that. Yeah. And so, okay, now, if you want to do revolution, yeah. okay, let's do it. But exactly. let's not say that we're going to plug into the existing system. I think we need revolution. I think the 21st century is going to need revolution. And there needs to be a revolutionary party. I'm not kidding. A revolutionary party that actually from beginning to end rethinks it all and then says this is the way it has to be because we can't afford the old bullshit. But it, but it has to be in that context. And, but and I want to be invited to that party. Yeah. <laughs> You see what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I do, but, but we that work. fragile complexity is just as utopian as as the uh, the, the, the what was shown in that small code. They both have hubris, and they're both. But you know what? But there's 270 of each. Right. And that that to me, what I'm saying is there should be 270 of the others. That's all. But I can, I'm not going to try to engage you. I'm sorry. No, I'm glad you engaged me, and I think that that is the next agenda. Please don't say that I didn't listen. Yeah. What I said is we're going to form a revolutionary party and create the context within which that particular yeah. utopia can exist in the new urbanism. That's what I said very clearly. Yeah. We need to write a code that can be sent in Twitter packages yeah. to anybody who wants them. Um, we're, there are people that are totally there, but you can't say that that replaces this. This is also for a world that absolutely exists. That's the problem that we're all having. That's, that's obviously yeah. a desire, but then we have engineers and other people that just you know, yes. um, stop all this other stuff. Yeah. To, uh, Paul can do his in five minutes, he says. So for those who really do have to leave at 1.30, um, why don't we do that? And then people who want to stay for questions, we can do that. Okay? All right. Okay, thank you. I'm Paul Crabtree, and I'm a civil engineer. And thanks to Emily, um, Emily's quote from Unwin, I finally found out what my addiction is. And I've got my, I keep filling my brain full of, practical technicalities. And here's one of them. This is, this is it, it looks like a, like a regulating plant, but it's actually, it's not T-zones and it's not sectors and it's not community units. This is a transect of impervious surfaces. And uh, what we did is there's two towns and a, and a county and we analyzed the entire watershed because they had flooding problems in their downtown. And we came up with uh, regulations, and these were called stormwater management zones, not, not transect zones, not sectors. They're called uh, stormwater management zones for the controls in, in each different type of uh, area. And then this, <clears throat> this work uh, is, came out of uh, Saratoga Springs, and, and I, I learned that working with Andres, he'll always ask me, how much will that cost? And he wants an immediate answer. And um, so w what we did is we prepared spreadsheets beforehand so that we could, on the fly, pr um, provide costs for different scenarios. So this is um, the different types of blocks that could be done, the, T, the T2, the T3, T4, T5, and T6. 
And then this is all the metrics of, the, of that particular block. And it tells what can go into it and, and how many people, how many, what types of buildings, square footages, that sort of thing. And then what we did is we then applied the cost for the infrastructure for that particular block. And then we could, we could tell um, how much that, that type of block, how much that would cost in terms of infrastructure. And then we did that with, with each, each of those types of, uh, of blocks in each of the T-zones. So that's the cost for that one. There's, there's the general urban block, the metrics, and then the cost for it. The urban block, the metrics, and the cost for it. Urban core, same thing. And this was the most intense one, and uh, those are the, the costs for it, because the, the pipes get bigger, the drainage is, is more intense, and that sort of thing. Now this, this is another example of um, stormwater regulations based on the nesting, um, the nesting of the smart code. So these were the rainwater, uh, this is a, sh the engineer shall do this at the sector scale. They'll do this at the community scale and this at the uh, transect zone scale. Um, that's uh, that's the community right. And then th uh, this is a uh, another uh, project from from Saudi Arabia DB DPZ project. This shows the the six neighborhoods of this project, and we were doing the preliminary engineering and this is an example of using the transect to make the engineering easier this um, this chart this this is the lighting chart and we placed all all of the light standards and we developed the the the, the matrix for each transect zone for what type of light goes there and the, and then we didn't have to detail each each of those hundreds of light standards. People could um, all all you have to do is look at T3 and what type of street, and that and that's the type of light standard that would go there. Similarly, with the uh, water and sewer, we did we. Uh, did it based on transect zones, and this is for the water services to a to a building or to a lot. Uh, normally, on an engineering plan, you would have to for each for each of those three or four thousand lots, you would have to say what size the the sewer line is, what size the 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 water service is, and what we did here is it's all in one in one chart based on the transect. So in T6, you, you need uh, larger water service, larger sewer service. And uh, that saved probably days of, of uh, detailing each and, every, each and every service. And actually, you don't even have to do your own drawing. You can just use the transect zone map. Exactly. And so now I can't wait to see the contractor out on the site with a regulating plan saying, okay, I'm in T3, and this is, this is the size of the services that we're going to put here. And uh, additionally, if the if regulating plans uh, tend to change before they get built, so if the T zones change, you, you, you're automatically okay. Even if the grid changes. Right. Right. And that's what I've got.